This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Then we're on. Today's guest, we've got Russell McVicker. Russell, how are you? Yeah, nice to meet you, Jax. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Another fascinating story. Maybe. Your father, who was very well known in Underworld. Right. Best-selling book, film out about McVicker, yeah. played by Roger Daltrey. Unbelievable film, probably one of the, the best crime films out there, especially in the UK. Yourself, you kind of followed in your father's footsteps. Bank robber, escaped from prison. Yeah. Nearly f- over 30 years in prison. Mad story as well. 20 years in prison. 20 years. Yeah. A long time. Sentenced? T- t- 20 years in prison. Yeah, I was sentenced about 35 years and uh, 10 years on the trot. I escaped a few times right. back in. Now you're here today. It's yeah. good to see you. A great honour to be on your show. And you know a few people who's actually been on the show. Paul Ferris, who's a good friend of mine. Paul Ferris was a very, very funny man. Brilliant badminton player and very good at chess. And it was like a war when I met him. And the other guy, who I, f- I think a lot of, is Paul Doyle. I was away with him two years. Tough bastard. When they get me for the, the uh, Picasso painting, but uh, Doyle was very quiet and very uh, subtle and an hard bastard, but mm. a lovely, lovely man. Them two, I think, a lot of. So if they're on the show, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, then it's, you know, it's good enough for me, yeah. I can tell you. I've got a lot of respect for those two men as yeah, well. Yeah, so have I. You know, a lot yeah. of love and care for them both. And mm. I'm, I'm pleased if. Uh, done well with itself now. Before we get into everything, no, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get okay. a bit of understanding about them, uh, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I'll sort of tell you what I can remember. Mm-hmm. I can remember sort of my dad. So I'll tell you how I come into being. My dad basically was was wanted in, in, in around about 64, 65. And what happens is he escapes with a guy called Roy Nash, who was one of the Nash brothers. They're a notorious gang from North London. You know, the craze would not step over him, they'd drop him out sort of thing. So he breaks off the the coach. And from that, as I believe it, he then meets my mum. And if not, before he gets nicked, he meets my mum. But the point was this, he meets my mum and with Roy Nash, and they, they both wanted to sort of talk to her. So they flipped a coin and my dad won the, the toss. It, my mum told me this. My dad talked to my, dad talked to my mum and Roy talked to my, my mum's mate. And so I didn't get born about 65, right? So my that's how I come into being, right? Through, through them two going to the same club that my mum was at. So from that, the first memory I have of my dad would have been when, I, when he was on the trot. So he gets an eight, breaks out, gets a 15 on top, he's doing 23 years, right? And then he breaks out the maximum security unit where they say most wanted, public enemy number one, wanted dead or alive and all them, them sort of tags. So I now meet him and I remember him, he had a moustache, a thick moustache. And he's kind of like, my mum's very warm, but my dad's very sort of cool and a bit, bit laid back. And he went, all right, Russell. And I remember looking at him and I had to call him Tommy because 
the be I never asked my mum why, but that was I had to call him Tommy. So the first time I remember him as my dad was when he brought a dog back to our home. And the dog's name was Fred. It was a mad dog that was going to be put down. So my childhood memories with my dad, I grew up in East London in Manor Park. My dad I, I don't I never played I never played with him there. So I think he used to come and visit and get off. So my early part of of knowing my dad was over Blackheath where they got him. So in the film, they that's the actual flat where they arrested him. So what happens is when I'm five, he teaches me chess. We do uh, running races, football. And uh, when we used to play to 10, he always used to let me get to nine, but he would never let me win. So part of my competitive nature is probably through him never letting me win. So one day we're having a running race. I'd, I'd cry, get to nine, he'd nick the ball and 10, nine. I'd like, oh, go, come on, come on, come And he's on a trot, don't forget. He's looking at her back. He's looking at 26 years. So, so one day we're having a race and he always picked me on the line. And my mum said, don't you ever fucking let him win. Don't you ever let him win. All right, she said, I'll race her. So my mum races my dad. But I've seen my mum over all the school from three onwards. That when she races other mums, she kills him. And she slaughters him in a race. We don't slaughter him, but she beats him. So that was a good memory. Um, so... That was, that's really basically the memories I have of my dad because then he's nicked, right? So when we used to meet my dad, my mum used to say, come on, we get on a bus and we get off and we'd run and we'd always be looking around. And I knew it was a joke, but I was picking it up that there was more to it than that. And we went on holiday to, uh, to Devon and I said to my mum, you know, this is vivid. I said, mum, there's a police car behind. I didn't know that he was wanted. I knew they didn't like the police. And that's that. But when we used to meet my dad, he is sometimes say, lay down, lay down, and lay down. Because if they, if my mum had been followed and then they've lost the flying squad, they wouldn't they wouldn't see the, the, the kid. Like my mum was always putting scarves on and taking them off. So when we used to meet my dad, we was very careful. And that's really what I remember about my dad. So I, I get... Between five and seven, I was a pretty well-behaved kid, but um, I used to gamble money up the wall. And this is significant for probably what leads me into crime a bit. I used to, sometimes mums used to arrive and say, he's took my kid's money. And my mum would say, he take his money. I said, no, I, I won it. I said, but sometimes I lose mum. I always had a, an articulate answer for, for, for mum. So you can't just take all someone's dinner money, give it back. So I grew up gambling from an early age and in football, running. I used to get in trouble between three and about five or six, but then I, I never got in trouble like fighting and stuff like that. But, you know, I can remember seeing a big stash of money, like maybe five grand in all five of us, because only five pound notes there, yeah? I just took 35 quid. I nicked it. I was only five and I nicked it. And I wouldn't do anything like that normally, but I nicked it. And I'm going to school and there's about 20 kids in the shop after. I've got, I'm waving this five around. It's all 20 kids, all buying sweets. I didn't buy none for myself. So anyway, I go back to my, heart, my house and my dad must have been there. So I remember my mum saying, I don't know where that money's gone. Right? She must have, I should know it. I don't know. So when I went to school next day, I threw it. I never told my mum. <laughs> I never told my mum that story, right? So that is kind of what I can remember. And when I get to about, before my dad's arrested, I would say I was football mad and always running races with people and that sort of thing. And then I get to uh, seven, my dad's arrested. And then my mum sort of fell out of my dad a few years later. So I never, I never grew up with my dad. So, did you know? Sorry. What did you know at seven? What he was getting in jail no, for? No, I didn't. I, I didn't. But um, when I knew he was an armed robber, I was made up when I was a kid. Because Were you buzzing with that? When I knew, yeah. You know, I don't know what age I was. Maybe twelve, thirteen. But my my mum. Part of the, I got a fascination for escapes, and like cowboy films and gangster films and all that sort of thing. We used to watch 
on the BBC One and BBC Two, all the films. And my mum said, watch this film. So we'd watch a gangster film, Edward G. Robinson, uh, Cagney. But the films I liked were like things about Jesse James. So when you're a kid, you play with pretend guns. And from five to seven, I was obsessed with, you know, gun, gun uh, games. And I was very good at them. So we used to have this way of playing where you start off all alone. And whoever gets killed first, you then become a gang. And generally it would be 8v1. And what I learned, I had a little trick. I would hide better than everyone else and come up onto them. And this is significant later. Because the one time I got caught, I came out earlier than what I would do. And, and I went around some bushes and all these guns come out. And, they, you know, you pretend you're shot. And but what I was thinking was afterwards, don't, I always remember be more patient. I'm an only little kid, I remember, I'm about six, seven. I always, so I always had quite a lot of patience as a kid and determination. I can remember marbles with a kid, an older kid. And I always remember you had to play your best marble if it was their best marble. And he comes especially to do me because he knew I was doing all the, all the kids my age. And I didn't really want to play, but he kind of, I can remember feeling awkward, so I played. And when I played him, I wanted to do an away shot. But because I felt embarrassed, I did a shot and I hit it. And it don't sound important this, but what it played on my mind was, or what it taught me over the years, you get like one shot or you, you get one chance, take it. That's what it taught me in a peculiar way. And if it was up to me, I can always remember clearly thinking I would have thrown the marble away, like a defensive thing. But because I'd done the shot, I realized you could be lucky if you went for your luck, all right? So from five to about 10, I was a clever gambler. I used to always have money. I used to wash cars with older kids and get money and buy my mum a present. So I was a good kid. My mum said I was always happy, but if, I, if, it, if it was a dispute, I could be awkward, I, I'd sulk. Or once I ran away from home for about 12 hours, um, I hid in a bush, it was freezing. My mate Guilford said, Russ, he said, they're going to call the police. I said, well, go and get me something to eat. I, I, I made him go because I knew she'd go around the shops where I go. And he got me some Kentucky. And I remember the beans. I was only six or seven, remember? I'm, not, I'm a little kid. I was eating the beans. And I remember the, the, the warmth of it. So I knew about hardship in a funny way, but not through my mum so much, but through, through experiences like that, you know, and... By the time I get to 10, my mum split me from all the kids I went to school with. They was going to what I call a very violent, bad school. But, you know, I had about five proper girlfriends and five or six, like, mates, and we, it, it split me. So I went to an all-boys school in Stratford, which was a very good football school. And um, when I got there, I wasn't good enough for the football team. Now, when I was in infants, I was very good at football. I played a year above. And, I mean, I, I used to go to football practice. And basically, on a Friday, I don't think I got beat for 18 months. I used to write down all the, all the scores. And I remember a kid saying, Russell's been beat, right? I remember that. I remember saying to my mum at five, Mum, will you time me? I'm going to run around the block. And these are unusual things for a kid to sort of do. I was sort of... I was a normal kid, but when it comes to anything competing, I really wanted to win. So I'm pleased that it didn't transfer into fighting because, you know, it would be like that now, you know, because you're always bumming into someone better, you know. So I was a determined kid and I was a sporting kid. And um, when I get to secondary school, basically what happens is I'm a good 800 metre runner. So Newham is a big area in London. I didn't get beat and I won the Newham Championship pretty easy. I get beat in the second final the following year. I come fourth. Kid run out in front. I've followed him. I said to my mum, oh, it's the only race I run wrong. But I said afterwards, I don't feel able to beat the winner. So I wasn't sore. And in the third year, I got beaten, I think, the first race. So I never run after that. But my school for football, they, they won the London Cup the first year, the second year, and the third year. And I could have been the, the sub or 
in the B team. So I was the B team captain. And um, Adam, which is Fred's uncle, he, he used to play at the back and I used to play at the front. And we basically would win every game. But I wasn't quite good enough. I knew, oh, you know, as you're a kid, you want to be a footballer, maybe a boxer. But I wanted to be a runner or a footballer. And by the time I got to the third year, I knew I wasn't quick enough. And when it came to football, I knew I wasn't good enough. The four guys in midfield, they were better than me. They had more quality, they had more speed. And so I played for them a couple of times. Like I played in, I forget what year, but I, I got a hat trick playing for them against the London squad that were a year younger than us. So the London squad were a year younger, were about as good as what my year at school was, right? So I then start bunking off. Now, I don't, I don't even remember, you, you know, you're younger than me, but if you wanted to take your O-levels, you had to take your mocks in the third year. So by now, oh, that's the other thing. When I'm about six and seven, we're a shoplifting gang. We're basically going in places and shoplifting six-handed, right? And what this taught me, a lot of it's to do with your central nervous system and sport strengthens it, I think. And it teaches you to, to be daring because you get frightened when you do something wrong. You should do anyway, and if you don't, <laughs> you're not wired up right. You know, when you do something wrong, especially as a kid, you feel it. So to Nick Sweets, you still got to have that bit of nerves. And if you do it enough times, you're used to the nerves. And I think as a criminal, you have to control your nerves. If you're not nervous, then there's something wrong with you. The nerves are good, but you have to be able to control them. And um, I think stealing the sweets when I'm a kid, it taught me, if you like, a bad habit for crime later. So moving on, I'm, I'm about 13 and I get caught bunking. You get the cane then. I mean, they smash you. There's no, it's a real bad pain, the cane. And they think you twice on the same spot, it's even worse. So they put me on report. So this again would be significant to my criminality later. You have to go and report, you have to just give you a bit of paper and every teacher you go into it has to be filled, you has to sign it. So all I did was copy the signatures. Now I was no good at art, but I knew how to copy a signature. I just used to practice. So when I become a fraudster later, I knew I could copy signatures. What ones I couldn't do, my mate, who also ended up a Czech fraudster, he was good at copying the signatures. So I used to never go to school. So I was in the top class or second from top class at Oyston every day. And that's all pretty normal. So the signatures helped me later, but now what happens next is a kid, a very good sportsman, takes me to the gym. I used to get all the Arnold Schwarzenegger books, the, 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 the muscle books they was called. Walter Bolton stuff. Yeah, um, Franco Colombo and all, all those guys from that era, just before the, the Hulk guy. He was a bat, but he was a little bit younger than them, I think. Franco, I can't remember his name, Lou Ferrino, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So these guys were like, I wanted to be like that. So I would have been an 18 stone by the time I was 22, 23. I would have, I would have gone on the roids is what I'm saying. I would have been a meathead, right? I was just fascinated by it. But what happened was when, when I'm 14, going towards 15, right? My mate, Stephen Granger, he takes me to a professional bodybuilder's gym. And his uncle, like, he's a champion, he's fourth in, fifth in Europe. And he said, right, boys, I'll show you how to try to use. You come in the gym, you do an hour, you do loads of reps, right? That was it. So I used to go to the gym. I was only a skinny kid, reasonably strong, but I used to play pool, and this would change things for me without me knowing it. So the guy who ran the gym was a geezer called Mick, and he was about, he, he, he's smaller than me. All the guys in there are like 18 stone from all the hardcore doors in East London. And I used to play pool with him and other people after I've gone to the gym. I'm bunking off now. <clears throat> and I noticed they was frightened of him. I noticed there was something I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand why someone so big was worried about this guy. He taught judo there. There was a thing upstairs and he taught judo. And he was handy because if he teaches it, and he, he wasn't always polite and they was wary of him. And I was impressed with that anyway. I used to play him and he, you know, I didn't pay for the games and he knew I was bunking off. Anyway, 
You don't know I'm McVickerson. No one knows I'm McVickerson. So what happens is, it's my instinct. I come in one day, I said, I said, I'll play you for money. All right. So we play for a pound, and I'll do him for a tenner. And it's because they can't believe it. He's a, he, he beat me eight times or nine times out of ten. And so snooker, I'm crap. But Paul, I'm good at. Like you could slaughter me at snooker. You still might beat me at Paul, but you won't beat me by much, regardless. Because I know how to play. Because this guy was very good, and so was his brother. His brother was a karate kid, about 21, 22, mix about 35. And he had stories of where he looked like he couldn't fight. He used to smash people. And they, they used to educate me how to play Paul. So what happens is, I win a tenor off this guy. And they're all looking, but only one of them had the bottle to go like that. He, he was a, he was named Bobby. So he went, well done, boy. So I look at this Mick, he goes to me, because his mood he was, give me the three quid. So come back tomorrow. So I'm expecting him to hustle me. He didn't. He went, as your seven quid, son, well done. So the other thing that happens about this time period, no, when I'm a bit younger, I'm playing poker. Now, about that age, I'm playing poker and I'm playing a postman. But what the postman don't know, when I'm 10, because I'm gambling obsessed, I'm not a great reader, I see a book called Whole's Thing of Gambling. It tells you the probabilities of everything. I read the whole book. And what I learned was poker, you can, if you've got skills, you can win. You can't win in a casino. You can't win with a bookies. You can't win on a fruit machine. And I learned this young. And I knew a little bit about poker. So when I play, I win, right? So I was getting 20 quid a week off him, off the back. I won five grand off him. I used to win a few hundred quid. So as a kid, I always had money for then. You've got to remember, it's not like now. If it had been now, it would have probably been a runner for an older gang on bikes and all that guaranteed I got roped into it because the money in fruit in you know I loved it and my pal when I was 10 I could quickly go back to 10 I was a money head my, my kid my mate my best mate he was getting a tenner for looking out for the police at seven in the west end for the ice cream vans right so that's it was a it was a wild culture it was looking out for the police uh, stray dogs up the road all, all over the place if you didn't if your mates weren't out you go and play you stop a bunch of kids say can I join in and play football so what happens is my mum goes down the ice cream gaff this is about the time my dad had been nicked and she said get everyone out here now she went berserk my mum's fiery right and the, the, the head the head traveller come out he went alright Sheila she went no I'm not fucking alright she said, get him out. She said, see him, no one. He don't look out for the police for no one. I come back with tenor, you know what I mean? She went berserk. So I got roped out of that. But when I'm a little bit older, I've got a mate called Matthew. And he's got a brother who's about, I might have been 13. He's got a brother about 17, 18. He's a ticket to have. And I know he can play 79, which I knew how to play. And I said, I want to play him, I want to play him. He said, if you won't play while he's got a grand, Russ, right? So what he used to do, if he only had 100 quid, I'd go and get him out of bed. So I was obsessed with gambling. He'd come down, big Jim, right? And he's a funny guy with 22 stone deep voice. And he'd smoke a cigarette. And we'd play, and he'd do me. I'd lose 20 quid, 40 quid. And he went to me. He went, son, you've got to pay for your education. And I never forgot that. It was a, like such a, a beautiful line, you know? And he's right, you have got to pay for your education. So... But what he don't know is I can play poker. So I lost. I must have lost about 200 quid to him. But he knows I get money and it don't matter to me over the months. So I'm playing poker. And he's doing money to me. But he's a ticket to He's older. He's a spiv. He's a hot cookie. So his brother is giving him treatment with a verbal. Yeah, big time fucking spiv. Fucking ticket to Getting his ass smacked by a scoreboard. And he's going like that. He's winding him up, right? So he attacks him. So he makes the noise. His mum comes down, gives him a slap. She says, you're barred, Ross. You're not supposed to be here, right? I sneak, I sneak around about 12 at night. This is four in the morning, right? I had to give half the money back because he can't win back his money. I said to Matthew, what'd you do that for? So I was battle-hardened from all these experiences from a small kid in gambling. So what happens now? I want to rob. So... I, just, I, I, uh, six, I had 80 quid, 100 quid. 
I've got to meet in a pub. My mate could drive. I said, you drive, I'll rob. I'll do the robbing. So I'm 15. So the geezer come out about 22. He went, let me figure something. I said, yeah. Right? I think my dad was out then, right? So I knew he was a robber and I knew he was a skater, you know what I mean? I can fucking believe it, but like, it's really more to do with Jesse James and watching the films as a kid, right? Something, something to do with me, old man. I love Jesse James and the great escape and all that, the, the, the Steve McQueen character. He just marches off to the block all the time. Every time he's caught, I'm like, whoa, you know what I mean? And my mum said, what'd you think of that? You know, she was like really enthusiastic mum. So anyway, um, the kid says to me, how old are you? I said, 15. He, went, he said, Russ, I can't give you a gun, mate. I said, why? He said, what's it for? I said, I'm Rob. He said, no. I said, all your dad says, I can't do that. I said, I'll give you 80 quid. He went, no, ain't no money. And I knew, you know, I went, okay, fair enough. And that was it. So now I said to my mate, we'll go and get a replica. Then I knew the West End, like right the back of my hand, because my mum used to take me down there. I knew parts of the West End, Soho and all that. I've been down there when the IRA have you give out warnings. You have to run. They, the police, and you have to run, you know. I can remember the, the um, couple of bombing campaigns, you know what I mean? You know, you was, you was frightened. You had to be careful. So anyway, we go down to where I knew because of my mum, and we're looking at the guns. I've got the money. I'm looking at the guns. And all of a sudden, the geezer come over here and he went, come here, you, police. He went, what are you looking at? It, it was u not uniform, planes. So I rung it. So I'm looking at the, 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 pen, the, the, the flick knife. He went, why aren't you at school? I said, because I went off school with my mum. My mum said, I'll have the rest of the day off. They never checked or nothing, right? Took our names. He said, if I see you down here again, looking in here, he said, I'll take you back to the school and tell you headmaster. So that was the end of the robbery game, thank God, because I would have been away, ball store or something, or I'd have been in trouble. I wouldn't have got away with it. We'd have got caught eventually, you know? So that was the naughtiest I ever was. There wasn't nothing I would say that, that was more serious than that, but how serious do you want it to be sort of thing? So Yeah, but get, weren't that gun at 15 to do a fucking turn? It's still bad to the average person. I'm pleased I wasn't thinking, but it's to do with... It's to do with the want of money. Mm -hmm. Was it to feed the Java gambling addiction? I did, I've got to be honest with you, it wasn't nothing to do with that. I did I did by the time I got to 16, but on the way to 16, I, I never actually lost. I used to win. I, I had something to show from the gambling, but I used to bet on horses and dogs. I used to give, not dogs, I never bet on dogs, football, and I used to give the money to older kids, or I'd put the money on myself, if it won, I'd get someone who's older to go and get the money. Do you see what I mean? Because they may not pay. I can remember always being lucky. But when I get to 16, my dad introduces me to his girlfriend, Bonnie. And she'd become like a second mum. She's a Brazilian woman. She had loads of energy, like loads of love and generosity. And what happened was, she says, what are you going to do? I'm 15 and a half. I don't even go to school now. There's no, no more of the, they give up on me. I was the only kid they give up on. And I was quite clever, but they they should have made sure that I couldn't fill in the, the things, really. But anyway, so she says, you want to come and work for me? You can be a runner. You can do the office where I make the teas. So I, I met people like Ben Elton, French and Saunders. I met all like, who would go on to be famous comedians. I met maybe seven of them. Joanna, I met Joanna Lumley through uh, Jennifer Saunders. So while, I, while I'm getting between 16 and 17, I sometimes see him and say hello, you know what I mean? Uh, Adam Faith, I knew. Uh, I knew a few of them at that time or a little bit afterwards. And what happens is, I'm straight guy and I'm happy. And I was a good office boy and people I used to go into the office, they say, why don't you come and work for us? Or when you leave there, you'll get more money here. But I was loyal to the lady, but in the end I thought, I'm gonna do book and cards. So I made a conscious decision. I've got no excuses for anything I've ever done because I've always been determined to do things. I've never, I suppose to do drift into things, but I've wanted to, I've, I've, had, I've had enough of working for 60 quid a week. It's all I was getting. It doesn't sound, it sounds impossible now, but when you're 16 then, that's all you've more or less got. So anyway, she said, I'll give you 200 quid. She said, you can, you can go and buy your first set of book and cards, which I did. 
So what I did, I'd find someone who knew someone. I'd say, get me out of your book and card. So I'm getting 50 quid a day now, right? And this is what happens. This is, this is our, so I'm only a part-time criminal. And I believe if you're a part-time criminal, it's a good thing. But a full-time criminal, you'll go to prison. And you might go to prison for a long time if you're a robber. So I didn't understand the difference, but I couldn't get enough book and cards, the method I had, I, you know, I was getting 50 quid a day. And what happens is, is now what makes me a professional criminal. What happens is my dad, when I'm 14 or 15, introduces me to a guy called George, Blond George. He was a brilliant TC man, great fraudster, very generous. I befriend these two boys who are my age, right? But they've got this, I used to play tennis. I was a good tennis player. I was a good tennis player as well. I used to play tennis with them, football, and that's it. Anyway, what happens is they've got a mate called Lawrence Sweet. He was a brilliant tennis player. You could, I couldn't beat him. Skinny Jewish kid, but a mad gambler. And one of the things he'd done, he was one of the best in the country. When he was 10, he would send he had a stomachache, climbed out the window, run down the betting shop, had a bet, the all loses, come back, and then comes out after like a 10 minute break, right? So he's a lunatic gambler. His auntie manages a, a gambling house in Albany Street, just off of Regent Street in the West End, with a, a big face called Mickey Falco. Now, if you read about the Falcos, they're from the 60s, when the crazy were about. He's the young brother. My mum used to go out of him, right? <laughs> I've got a picture of him, even now, today. My mum's still got a picture of him, right? I said to my mum, he looks like, like, really, he was the best dressed, really. He looked, he looked the best out of everyone I've ever seen photos of, right? So my mum said all, all, all the women liked him. He was like the heartthrob sort of thing. She went out of him for like six months or whatever, right? So anyway. So when she was younger, so I go in the gaff. He says, "How's your mum, Ross?" I says, "Right, Mickey." You know what I mean? He's like he's, he minds the gaff. There's loads of gamblers. It's a tall, a tall building, um, and I'm sitting here as I'm sitting here, right, with with Lawrence. I might have eighty quid and me hundred quid, and there's a geezer here, right? <laughs> he's got loads of curly hair, biggest face I've ever seen, and they call him Mad Mick, right? Now this geezer is not violent. But he's verbally very sharp. He's a pro gambler, right? He's 26, 28. So we're talking away. He don't know I'm a vicar, so he might have swerved the issue, right? So I said, you play Paul? He went, yeah. I said, I played with money. He said, how much? Three quid? I said, no, I've got money. I've just got my readies out. I've got readies here, right? <laughs> so he says to Lawrence, what's your hot shot fucking play? It won't make no difference. I could be twice as good. He'll get my money. So... Lawrence says, it'd be close. He says, you better pot. He said, but he's clever how he puts the ball. He, said, but he says something like that, right? So he says, I'll play you. So he's coming in. So we go downstairs into a basement. It's dingy. And it's six o'clock at night. He says, I've got to have an edge. I don't understand what he's on about. Well, I do, because the, the, the casinos have got an edge, haven't they? Everyone, you know, all betting shows, there's an edge. There's the little tax thing. I said, go on, in what? All right, I've got the gift of the gab. I'm not shy, all right? I'm, I was, I, I must have been 18 now, maybe, you know? So he said, you pay for every game. Now, each game is 20p. I said, I'll pay for the game, no problem. So we start. It starts at six o'clock. And it finishes at six o'clock in the fucking morning. So basically what happens is everyone in the building sort of, now the verbal's gone around the gaff. The vicar's son's downstairs with fucking Curly Mick. Curly Mick will... Slap me ass for my money within two hours. So got all these people coming down, and it's really close. But I'm always in front by a tenner or something, right? And they're coming down. They're giving him the, the app. And after about eight hours of me with, with the thing, he's got. I need a break, Mister. He said to me, Mister. I need a break, right? He said, "There's fifty p. Go and have a coffee, right? But drop me out for the fucking verbal, Russell." Like, right? when he comes back down, he goes to me. Oh, it gets worse, son, with you. He said, "You're my vicar, son. I can't fucking believe it." He said, "I might just pay you now and fuck off." He said, "I don't want your dad coming down here and slapping me because I take your money off you, right? All that." So anyway, at twelve, at the very last game we've had twelve hours. We can't take no more. He's got a shot. He said, look, instead of me taking the shot, take the tenner. You can say you beat me. And really, I should have took the tenner because I was that sort of kid, you know what I mean? But I thought, nah. I said, you make the shot. He said, well, good decision. He said, because 
I'm, I'm on fives on, but he said, I'm, I'm twos on, but I'm not fives on. So he said, well done for working it out. He pots the shot. I give him back the 30 quid, but I was in front. And I said, thanks for the game, Mick, right? I said, we're level, right? He went, we ain't. He said, check your pockets. So I get my, I'm a tennis short. We played about 50 games, you know, five times 10. So for a pound, you get five games. And I've done, I've done, I've done a tenner. And he went to me, that is what I mean by an edge. So all those things understood, Jimmy saying you've got to pay for your education and other things. Because I was battle hardened to go to 12 hours, what happens is he likes me because of that. Otherwise, we go our separate ways. And now this is how I become a, a professional Czech fraudster. He said, I know a gaff in Denmark Street. Opposite is the Frasers, I've got a gaff, young Frank and Jimmy. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a den of thieves. There's the, pick, the four card, the three card trick mob. And that's another trick. I knew how to do the three card trick, but not the way they do it. And I used to win money at that. If you see it 50 times, you, you get the card. But if I only do it 10 times, you, you won't see the card. Right? So I used to get money at that as well, right? So what happens is you could buy a book and card, a page for three quid. So I start buying book and cards and I can copy the signatures because I've learned it when I was bunking off and all that, yeah? And I start getting 100 quid a day, 200 quid a day. And what happens is I just went to everyone, I pay a fiver a page. I get the lot in the West End. So all of a sudden this young kid, I was about 18, I'm getting 200 quid a day. But what happens is, I get nicked during this time, and I get nicked on a book and card charge, and I would have got bail, and I, wouldn't, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go to prison for it, but this coser hated me. He knew the name and all the rest of it, and he stopped. He did everything to stop me getting bail. So I do four months, and while I'm away, what I, was that like? I hated it. The first day killed me. If you, if, you want to stop, if you want to stop your kid getting in trouble, right, this is what I would do. I say, come on, tough guy, right? I say, I'll tell you what we'll do, yeah, we'll have a bet. I'll give you a tenner for every hour you can do in your bedroom on your own, no TV, no thing. And the kid won't last two hours. So if you put, if you'd have put me in a room, I did have patience though, so maybe this trick wouldn't work, but the point is this, before, if, if you go to prison, you acclimatise. But if you don't, and you said to a kid, Come on, boy, like you, your own kid, go in the room, see how long you last. It might last three hours. Say, would you like to do three years? Yeah, the kid would be frightened. But it's too late once they go and they take and they, they climb, they, they adjust. That's the problem with, with crime. So if I was a judge, I'd say, you know, he's just come off the street. I'd say, bang him up for a week or a day. Put him in the cells for a day and see how he handles it. And, and I think that put a lot of people off. I hated the first day. I had murders of this, you had to call them, sir. I couldn't believe it. You know, they come heavy on me, right? And they know my daddy's and all that, right? Not that I've, I was using his name, but it was on the probation reports, they knew. Is that a disadvantage in there because of who your dad was? Yeah, massive disadvantage, right? So, but they may not fancy beating me up. Do you know what I mean? But I, you say, sir, and if not, we come down here, son, do you understand? It's, I was 19 then. So what happens is, so I'd lasted a while, maybe a year with the kites, getting a good living. And now I do the four months. I come out, and when I went to court, I had two incidents there. I, I, they, they moved me from a cell and I slammed the door, like terrible loud noise. I wouldn't move cells, that's right. And that was my first nicking. They come for me, mob handed, 15 handed. I mean, I was like that. They walked me down to the block. And my mum visited me, she said, listen, Always stick up for yourself, but be careful down here. Because like, for instance, my dad, when he was at the Scrubs, my grandmother told me, she said, they stopped us seeing him. And it's because he carried on fighting with him to such an extent when he was 24, they smashed him to pieces. He would, he'd come out on a, on a stretcher. My mum knows all this because she, she knew all the stories. She said, be careful down, down there, boy, okay? Just be careful, try and get back on the wing. So a week later, a week for slamming the door. Then I chin a kid. They kept me on the, they put me on the up plate then. So anyway, when I go to court, there's a screw. When he put me on the up plate, he said, I don't want you on here. You're only on here because the governor said give you a chance, right? 
But when I went when I went to court, he went, Grant, that was my name. He went, Good luck. And I appreciated that. Do you know what I mean? I've got to walk out. So what happens is I've got a six month of bender. If I commit an offence, they can give me six months, arguably. But what happens is I was doing betting shops. There was a guy called Murray the Head, who was a diamond thief. And he introduced me to doing betting shops. I never come close to getting caught in the bank. So what happens is I carry on doing the betting shops. I only go and do the same geese I've done before. He recognises me. I never recognised him. And um, when I go to court to finish my bender, I, I walk in, I had a cashmere overcoat, right? <laughs> really smart one. Walked in like as if I'd be gangster. And the coser had to give me, he had 700 quid of mine when I was next, right? And he's looking at me, but he's got a big smile on his face. I think, why is he smiling, right? So, barrister said, they're saying about extra charges. I thought, fuck it now. I'm going to do six months. So I skip out. He said, don't go through, don't go through. He said, because you'll get bail. He said, but then you might get a little bit of bird. But he said, you should be all right today. Cos has come running down. I go back up. The judge says, you should have come here last week. Never mind about leaving on the day. He served his time. Off you go. So I come out and hated this Cosa. He, he counted out the money. He said, he said, you won't keep it. He said, you're off to Islington Police Station now. So I go to Islington Police Station, right? And they say, you're probably going to get charged, but not today. So you come back in a month. And I think I come back in a month and they charge me. So what happens is I, I do two or three months. And I, I said to my mum, I didn't say to my mum, I said to my mate, I'm going to not go on the last one. What happens is in the meantime, a kid called Strawberry Mick, He's working, so now I go up into the next stage of crime. He's working with a traveller's checks guy. So you know what traveller's checks are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You might get a grand a day. You might get two. And you don't get no money, and then you get... So for a day's work, you can get two grand. He said, Russ, I'm getting six months in three days. He said, I can't get out of it. He's a creeper. He said, why don't you take over? So I say, yeah, I'll take over. And... Um, he said, can you do, I said, you know, I can do signatures. So I meet this geezer in a Porsche, South London face. He's got a massive house swimming pool. He said, I heard you're a good kiter. So I'm all right. So what happens is, I think, I start getting two grand, a grand, 500 quid, a grand. So when I go out the first day with this guy, I have, a, I have an up. But this is, this is what the problem is. If you use, if, 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 I, if I had your Travis checks from Scotland, they'll be on a list. If they come from America, they won't go on a list. It, it never, the stuff never comes back. But what was happening was he had a connection for unsigned gear and there was hundreds of grand's worth of gear going missing. So what happens is it was going into, say, the Tim Pan Alley. Get it given to you for halfway, right? Like there'd be someone in there who was in charge. I didn't know it was. You, you pay halfway, right? One person can only get 20 grand down over two days but it goes to other firms. You have to all start on the same day. So you all agree where you're going to start. So what was happening was, if you lost a photograph, they was getting like the odd photograph of me. They didn't dab it. And they was going, who's this kid? You know, found it was that. Like, who, who? They didn't know who I was. No one knew sort of who I was, right? But someone said like, you fucking, you, you, they, know, they know about you, but they don't know your name, right? You fucking, you, you want to be careful, son. Right? Anyway, what happens is, I speak to Blonde Jules, he says, you've got to be careful, you, you mustn't lose photographs. You can't lose photographs. But what you can't do is, is use unsigned. They put all their work into it. So what happens is this. It's lucky, but it's unlucky. They get my dabs, they go, it's fucking Mick Vickers, son. Let's go and get him. They come to get me. I'm on, I, I I'm, don't go back on the, the check thing that I get charged with. It's three months in, but on about the third month or the second month, I never go back to the court proceedings. You know, you, you go every month and it goes to the crown or it goes wherever. So I'm, I'm on the trot. So when they go to my mum's, I'm not there. When they try and find me, I'm not on the grid. I'm not, I ain't got a driving license. I haven't got a bill in my name. So what's happening there? I think I'm just wanted for a 50 quid check from a betting shop. I would have probably got eight months. So... Shrewd nuts are saying, you shouldn't be doing the unsigned. You, 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 they, they'll kill you for it because it's part of like a million pound fucking swindle over months. 
I've joined the, the firms throughout London, but I'm a little bit naive. I'm game, but I'm losing photos. So people working on a, on a, with no photo probably don't get caught. But anyone with a photo, you get caught. So what's happened is I'm now living in the Cotswolds. Right? I didn't have much money. And I just think I'm wanted for like a small amount of thing. But someone told me, if you're doing unsigned and you've lost photos, it'll come on tumble, right? So I'm hoping. So what happens is I go into a hotel to have a shave. I had eight grand's worth of traveler's checks. And I've missed the door to have the shave and I've gone into an office. Guys, what are you doing here? He thinks I'm a creeper. There's a lot of creepers about. So I say, I'm sorry, but he chases me. I get nicked. I go to the police station. I give a moody name. Back in the day, it didn't matter if they took your prints then, they had to send them to Scotland Yard to do them. They didn't do them at the station, it wasn't possible. So I said, well, I get bail. She said, get bail, possession. But what's happened is, my girlfriend wasn't at the flat, at the house. You know, she was similar age to me, she wasn't there. So when you have to get bail in the morning, oh no, I can't get bail, fucking, that's it. So when I go to court the next day, I'm hoping no of the traveller's checks have come back. But what happens is, there's a cousin there, he said, he's wanted for hundreds of grand's worth. He's, worth, he's Russell Grant McVicker, and he's banging trouble, sort of thing. So I'm off. So I go, go into custody, and they said, we've got about 300 grand's worth to show, show it, right? So you had a choice. You could either go into, to the, when you go to court next, you, you could either go into the check for all thing and look at all the things, and this is how it works. While I'm at the scrubs, there's a geezer called T.C. Clay doing a seven. And this is what he said to me. I said, can I escape from the station? I'll go to the station. He said, fucking hell. He said, there's, he said, what it is, there's two sides to the jail. And this is what they'll do. They'll show you loads of gear. Some of it will be yours, some of it won't. If you lie to them and they know you're lying, then you're going on trial for the bits you don't. He said, and this is what happened to him. He gets a seven when he could have got a five or a six. But he... He, he went guilty on some, but ran a trial on others, and it was proven against him. So he is advising me what to do. So I said, okay. I said, can I escape? He said, yeah. He said, but there's two sides to the thing. On this side is where they show you all the kites. He said, when I got there, I was going across like that. He said, and then they kept me on this side. He said, so you need to be on that side. So anyway, I go into custody on a three-day thing with a brief and all that. And the first day they put me here, which is the wrong side. So without all this information, what I do next don't work. So I said, it's too noisy. I want to be on the other side. He went, no problem, right? So that night I'm on this side. I, get, I said, I want to, I want to hours exercise. So they cuffed me to a tall cosa. So I walked around, I said, what's left? He went, that's Parliament Square. So I can't run that way if I get the chance. I said, what's right? He said, there's a bridge and then there's a, 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 an estate. So only anyway, it's cut a long story. Next day, I'm cuffed. I'm cuffed coming back. I'm cuffed, right? On about the third, on, on the next trip, I'm not cuffed, right? You've got no chance with me, trust me. On, if he don't grab me, he, he ain't got a chance. My heart's going, I thought, fucking hell. Now, while this is all going on, there's people in the tin pan, right? talking to against he's, he's down the thing, he's going to make one, he's going to make one, make one. They're all fucking drinking. It's, it's about 50 people know on the street, right, that I'm going to make one if I get the chance. But they don't really think it's going to work out, right? So what happens is, I bolt. I'm gone. There was no causes coming in. On other days, there was cars coming in and things happening. I could have been unlucky. I get away. And what happens is, I run, and I, I, I thought, I've been running now for over a minute. I thought, I'd best go up. So I've gone up some stairs, and some kids saw me. They never shot me, because most kids don't like coppers, right? So I thought, I've got to hide. So I knock on the door, knock on the door, knock on the door. A woman says, who's that? I says, Mills on Wheels. She went, what? I says, Mills on Wheels, man. I put a funny voice. So she went to me. She opens the door. I kick the door open. I get on my knee. I said, lady, please. I said, John McVicker said, I just escaped from the thing down the road. I shut the door behind me. I said, please, I'm not like a burglar or nothing bad. I said, you can ring my dad, and he'll come and get me, please. I was on my knees like that. I said, please. All right. I can hear Cosa shouting. You could hear him shouting. I'm thinking the kids might have think. They even knocked on all the doors. 
She rang my dad. She said, he said, he said yeah, I'm just saying, I'll come and get him. He said, tell him I'll be an hour. He said, let it die down, right? Her husband come home. I said, I'm so sorry, mister. I said, I feel, I said, I'm so sorry. Because I frightened the woman, you know what I mean? But I got on my knees straight away. I said, I'm so sorry. But it's all right, son. Anyway, I had a cup of tea, some biscuits. And when it was time to go, my dad rung. They, they, she went, oh, no, he went down and checked. He said, your dad's there. I said, thank you so much, you know what I mean, for your kindness. So I was lucky. I go downstairs. I go to get on the floor. He goes, there's no one here. Who are you worried for? So we drive off. He gives me a hug. He says, look after yourself. So I'm now banging trouble. They're looking for me all over London. But I was slippery. So I'm at a first gaff. I move out. They missed me by two days. It was my girlfriend's gaff. I had nowhere to go. Then I had somewhere to go. And while I was doing the travellers checks, two people showed me what the undercover vans looked like over South London. There were squads in these gaffs. And the TC guy, who was a pro, who used to get the gear, he said, that's what the vans look like. That's what you're looking for, right? So on one of the gaffs over Stoke Newton, I see a van. So I don't go back, right? Then I'm crashing it, I'm getting money again, but I won't do unsigned because I know it'll come back. So I was doing checks for cars and I would have got nicked. But one of the cousins in charge of the case, where he took a car off someone who we've sold it to for four grand worth seven, he said, we'll get them. He said, you get your money back, mate. He said, but we'll get this little firm. He said, because they're greedy and they're only working out of one magazine, we'll get them. And because of that, I stopped doing that. So I was getting money. I had different girlfriends staying in hotels. And basically, they, I, I had a Swedish girlfriend. So I'm going to Sweden, I'm going to things. So I was here, there and everywhere and I was doing well. And they kept missing me in certain places. Like they go one place, I come back from Sweden one, one occasion and I thought I'd go home. So I didn't go home, I thought I'd ring first. I rang my mate, I said, go and check if where I am is all right. And when I can tell you now, it ain't fucking all right. They've been there a week. I went on holiday about two days before they arrived. And when I've come back, I've checked. And the reason it must have been, because I never give my phone, I never had a phone, but I had a phone at McGaff, and about four people had rung, and I knew that was dangerous, like people in the TC game. So someone had shot me. I slipped in there, and then I'm over the angel. This is months later. I'm still getting money, and I'm staying in a woman's gaff, right? And what she says to me is, like, all of a sudden, I'm staying there. She goes on holiday, and I stay with uh, my, my Swedish girlfriend. All of a sudden, a, a big, heavy gangster comes around from the plot, right? From Islam. So I see him out the window. I thought, what the fuck's he want, right? So I go downstairs. I said, sweet? He went, yeah, sweet. Let me come in. I said, come in. He went, listen. He said, oh, Bill, we're on the plot. It's either you or me, right? So I went, I think it'd be with you. He said, I won't tell you what I know. He said, someone's seen them. They're plotted up around there. He said, they've plotted over there. He said, that, he said my gaff's there. He said, your gaff's there. He said, one of us. So what I do, I move out to a friend, this, this woman's friend next door, too along. So what I was doing, I give my eyes a chance, checking everywhere. There was no, no police following me. So I thought, it ain't for me. What I'm doing still, I'm going in her front door, the downstairs door, going out the back, and I'm going into the house I'm now staying in. <coughs> On about the 10th day, one morning, they smash the door off, run upstairs. No warning, smash the other door off, and I'm not there. So what are you doing to my door? It's Carol. She said, what are you doing? So he's trying to speak. He went, no, no, no. We know he was here, Carol. Don't start all that. He said, he must have gone up there. He said, the ladders are there. He couldn't, as, he said, he might have drawn up a pair of ladders. So they go upstairs, and they think I've gone along the building and got out over there. They haven't, I'm, I'm in bed next door, right? So I slipped in there. So now we're getting up to about two years. So what happens is I end up at another gaff. And so I decided to go past Carol's. And one of the things I was told what they used to do then, they used to do illegal taps. So they put up a tent outside a BT tent and they took it up. It's illegal. It was never a legal one. And I rang her from the West End. I said, listen, I said, I've been past your gaff. Be careful what you say on the phone. Cut a long story. I'm at another gaff and I'm using a call box. And one day, as I use a call box, I see the, the same sort of tent. And I thought, you go cold. I thought, I bet it's on me. 
So I say what I'm saying, put the phone down. I go in and I, I get on them, right? I thought, fuck me, they're going to do me. They won't do you at night, do you in the morning. So I come out, I get a taxi to Islington where there's a massive estate and I walk in to the estate. I hide, I look down and I see them looking for me, but they go off. They think I must be in the house. So I don't go back there. And I think that was the last time I slipped them. So what happens now, I've, my options are all changed. I can't, I can't get traveller's checks. When I go on a meet to get some traveller's checks, some ID, a kid said to me, I can't believe it's you. He said, that's why they've been round. He said, he said, you must have someone who's lolly you. He said, because they're all round here. It's only a bit of ID. He said, I didn't know it was for you. He said, he said, he said someone's name. He said, you know, he, he introduced me to meet him, but he didn't say to him it was me. Right, he said he'd be in the car. So he said, Russ, he said, you tr must have someone who's no good. He said, because I'm telling you, there's no one, there's no drug firms around here. It's fraud mob, right? So what happens is, I, I didn't really think it was, I didn't really think I would get caught. But what happens is this, yeah, I must have been trusting someone from the West End, not a proper pal, but a, from Travelers Tech or ID. So what happens is, my very last day, I'm now going to South Africa. I'm going to go to Tenerife and I'm going to go across on a boat. So what happens is, I said to a kid, I said, I don't fancy him there in, in, in this cafe. I said, paranoid, he'd fucking need to be on you by now, right? I said, fair enough. So what happens is, I go to Windsor. I go to Reading, put four grand or eight grand traveller's checks down, cut it up with a kid. We're now going to something to eat. We're now driving to the airport. And I said, don't fancy the van. He said, Russ, he said, there's vans everywhere. I said, don't fancy. I said, do a, go straight and then do a, suddenly have the van come with us. So he goes twice around the roundabout. And I said to him, listen, I don't fancy it. I fancy Swerve. I'll go back. I'll drop out the, the, the aeroplane to Tenerife. What happens is I get to the airport. It gives me a big hug, right? The kid, this kid's not the grass. He gives me the hug. He says, over. Now, I would have gone to South Africa and worked in someone's company, building company or something. I can't do that, but he would have taught me. I go through the airport. I, sit, I have something to eat, a glass of water, coffee, and I enjoy Sims on the thing. I'm walking through, the door opens, shuts. As I go like that, the the um, the six cars, I think they're customs. I didn't think they was police, right? I, you know, because I, I thought maybe I'd been recognised fucking sitting in the gaff. It opened up. I mean, what seems to be the problem? He went, the problem, Russell, is about a million pounds worth of traveller's checks. It wasn't that much I'd done. He went, you're nicked. Right? So they nicked me, put me in a room. They couldn't get clearance to take me straight out. So I'm sitting there for five minutes like this, right? Like that, sorry. So what happens is we're walking through and they're, they're chipping charging. They're making a joke. We thought you'd be out in Hollywood now or thing and this, that and the other. All, all little jokes. They're saying all names that I've used in hotels or for properties where I've rented. So that's it. I get charged, right? I get, um, I get, they don't, they don't keep me there, right? I go court the next day and you go to Lambeth, right? They hadn't put me, I was on the e-list, but I went to Lambeth with everyone else. What happens is, at the time, everyone, the police was having, it was overcrowded. This is 1986. It was over, uh, 1988. It was overcrowding. So what they've done, I think they dug me out on purpose, not the police, but the, the court mob at Lambeth. They've put six of us up towards Halifax. Other places are going into different police stations. So there's like three or 400 unlucky people or lucky people going into police custody. So what happens is I, I'm cuffed to another grant. I said, do you want to try and make one if we get a chance? He went, no. So what happens? I'm on the coach outside Lambeth. Now remember, I've only been nicked after two years I, I was on the trot. He's got the door open and I've got like, um, I've got like a, a thumb that I can, it's hard to say, but I can put my thumb in. What he's done, he hasn't put it on as tough as what he should do. And I'm going like that. I got it till the knuckle and one of the cosers got up to check the cuffs. I had to push it back and it caused me a bump. Right, it's coming around, gone like that. I couldn't get back up. I get to we, we now go to Halifax. I think the door shut and we went. So I missed my chance by about a minute. If I'd have been a bit quicker, I would have got out. So anyway, I now go to Halifax after an eight-hour journey, and they all know the kids I'm with. They go, "Fuck, you know, two robbers there. This geezer of salt, the other geezer are cutting someone. Two, two, two armed robbers here, right?" As you was unlucky. So anyway, what happens is. 
I go in the Halifax station. And when I get off, the coser, he didn't even cuff me. He had it like that. And I thought I could have chinned him, but I'm only looking at about a free stretch. Right? Maybe three and a half years. For a million quid's worth? It wasn't a million quid's worth, no. But they had that down? It got, it got it down to 100 grand's worth in the end. Oh. They, they, they say that, but what you've got to understand, right, they, they just do it so that you go guilty and put, explain what's yours. Because if you don't, it's a lot of headache. Yeah. So they, it's, like, it's a bit like saying, go guilty is really what it is, right? Mm. So anyway, what happens is, I have murders with the police, right? So they fucked me off to some other gaff. He said, you're going to a hard gaff now. It's, it's me, it's a, it's a big, big police station and they're expecting you. They're not having your bollocks. How long have we got? How long have we been no, talking? No, All right, so what's happened this year? I get there and so there was a sergeant, right? He said, you can play football here, six-handed in that yard. He said, you've got a skipping rope. He said, you can get nice and fit for your next escape grant, right? That was his thing. He never, he never stopped saying it, right? That was his little uh, thing. So while I'm there, we're about 20 handed. He let me have a visit with my Swedish girlfriend with a closed cell door, and there was murders with some DI. He said, You can't fucking trust him in a cell when you're only. He, but he didn't done me a favour. <laughs> you know, it was a cause of it, but he done me a favour. So he's always saying about your next escape, your next escape. So it's my turn to now go. It's two weeks later. You now, I've now got a court appearance. Right? And I might go back to the scrubs, I might go to the scrubs, sorry, or I might go back into the police thing. It depends on the luck of the draw or what they decide at Lambeth. So I'm on the coach. It's about three in the morning. We, tr we travelled eight hours. Right? I said to the kid here, if we get a chance to escape, he said, I don't want to escape. So they said, who wants to go for a piss? So I said, me. So one kid gets off and they was all scuffling around. And I was thinking to myself, you're not really concentrate it's all of a sudden it was like it was a bunch of old billies going to the the, the coast they don't realize got someone desperado here I, I will take i will take a chance and go but how am i going to get out of the cuffs so what happens is the coster comes over and he cuffs this hand to his or he cuffs this hand to his appropriate he, that's right he cuffed me to he, he, he turned around put me there and what i done i went like that i don't know why i've done it right i put my hand like that so the kid, the kid said, go, I went like that. And he put the cuffs over. So now it's on a bigger sort of wrist. And he went, and it's dirty. As I brought my thumb away, I thought, I'll slip that easy. It's no trouble at all. So I get up. I had to wait for some other kid. I get up. Now, they should have been too handy with me because I'm a scapee. But it didn't follow the procedure that they should have, that would have been in place. So we're walking. It's the M1 now. It's three in the morning. And as we walk, I thought, shall I go now? And I should have gone then. The reason being, when I get to the, have a piss, there might be a cause of weight comes to wait outside. Anyway, I go in the toilet with him. He said, you want to go first with me? I said, you go first, right? He, he turned around right in the corner. I went like that. It was easy. I went like that. And as I went like that, I see him go. I'm gone. I go across the M1 and I'm off, right? They didn't have the bottle to come across. They wasn't going to do that. So I run and I see a, a railway line. I thought, well, my dad's filming me going, he runs along a railway line. But I thought, no, nick that out. I fell into a river and it gave me pneumonia. I've got a, a water on the lung. I find a, a, a park, like a, where they had lorries. I get on the lorry, undo it. And I get into, there's two big things. I climb up and I hide. I'm there for eight hours. About seven in the morning, lorry driver comes and we're driving. I'm thinking, this is it, I'm sweet. All of a sudden, he's got a stop over, like, a roadblock. This is eight hours later. So I heard the cause I say, has anyone been, could anyone have got on this lorry? Now, he should have said, yeah, because it was open, but he didn't say that. He went, no, no one could have got on this. What's the problem? He went, we want to look in the thing. So I'm thinking, I'm fucked, right? He said, you've got a torch. <laughs> so he gives him a torch. They open the things, and the cause climbs up, puts a, a light down on that side, Climbs down. Now he's got to come this side. There's only one more thing. I, I, I couldn't have got out. I'm shivering. It's really freezing. And because um, I'm so through with a, with a fall in the, in the river or a canal. I only swam from here to over there. So anyway, he didn't bother looking in the thing. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm double sweet. So I went to a lorry park and I climbed out. I said, I'm this guy. He said, oh, fuck it. He said, fucking hell, was you on the thing all the time? I went, yeah. I said, would you give me a lift where you're going to next? He said, yeah. He said, but I've got to load up for an hour. I said, I can't wait. I've got to go. So I go. I climb out of this place. 
And I go to ring my mate, Big Jim. And as I ring him, I couldn't remember the number. My mind went blank. I couldn't remember the fucking number. So some kid walked past about 18, 17. I said, mate, I said, would you live around here? He said, yeah. So you live with said, mum. So you live in your own? He said, yeah. He said, do you like the police? Nah. No. I said, I what it is, I've escaped from, he went, you're an escapee. So what do you mean? He said, it's all on the fucking news, mate. I said, would your mum let me stay? He went, I think so. I said, I'll give her some money. I said, I can't remember my mate's fucking number, but I swerved for whatever reason. I said, have you got a cab number? And he did. I said, ring me a cab. So this cab driver comes. So what happens is I get a taxi. I, I, as he's going somewhere, I said, do you want to take me to Cambridge? And this would be an error. And he said to me, um, I said, how much? He said, 50 quid. I had 25 quid on me. I said, take me in town. So he says, well, there's roadblocks here, please. I said, can you avoid, avoid the roadblocks? He don't know I'm, 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 I'm the guy, but he suspects I might be. So he avoids them and I get out. So I get on a coach to Cambridge and on the way, I thought, there was something in me that I thought, get off the coach. I didn't. So anyway, I get fucking pulled in on the way to Cambridge and there's police there and they get on the coach. So I went, oh, fuck it now. And I've gone in a swimming pool and I put a jacket over my, my thing, but I should have got rid of my top. And I didn't. The reason I didn't get rid of it, I probably wanted to fucking say I escaped in this, some ego shit, right? <laughs> I should have got rid of it. So he's come up to me. He said, um, where you come from? I said, I just come with my grandma. What's the problem with you? Right? I put on a fucking man. I said, what a problem? He said, he looks at me. He said, you look like someone who's escaped. I said, you look like someone escaped. What color eyes have you got? I knew what, I knew what, what color eyes have I got here? Yeah, what color eyes? Blue green. Well, they said blue, which I guess right, right? So I said, he said, blue. I said, my eyes are green. My eyes are green, but they look kind of blue, right? <laughs> so I knew that, right? So anyway, he fucks off. And I thought, I've done him. Now, I've been in loads of banks over the years, and you judge, it's the body language. I suppose it's a bit like a boxer. You can tell before it happens. And I, I thought I was sweet. I thought, I'm sweet. I thought, God, oh, fucking hell. I knew to get off early. I had it in my head, get off, get off, get off. And I didn't. That's what I'm talking about. You get an opportunity and you don't take it. And this is all through my life. I always get the first opportunity. So he come back. He went, what it is? He said, let me see what you've got underneath. He went, it's a yellow top. It's a yellow, it was a, like a rugby thing. So you have to come down the station. So as we get off, I'm going, I said, fucking hell, man. What the fuck is the problem, man? Yeah, okay, don't bother. So as I get off, I bolt. I run down a dead end and they dump me. So I go to the station and they bang me up. Because I come in, he said, there's been a burglary in town. He said, you're getting a, an internal search. I said, go and get him. I'm freezing now, right? I'm like that. I can't. I'm gone. My temperature's dropped. They call the doctor. He leaves the cell and he don't lock the cell, right? He's gone free along, gone into another room. I just bolted out. I've gone, gone further down. I could see there's three people there talking. I couldn't go there. I go into the back room where they do the prints. There's only a skylight. I couldn't find the thing to do it. So I stood on the, the center thing and I'm going like that. I had about another three minutes. It was going like that. It's really slow. It wouldn't go up. Another two or three minutes I'd have been out anyway. I heard him coming. I hid. And he's just come out. He said, we said, what are you doing acting silly for? Come on. Right? I said, I'm not having no internal. He said, no, you said, you're going to hospital. So I go to hospital. And what happens is this. I'm down in the hospital for a three-day thing. I've got uh, something on the lung, water on the lung. And there's a cosset there, yeah? So we, there's now an argument. She, some woman gives them tea and biscuits, but not me. So excuse me, nurse. I said, can I have tea and biscuits? So I'll see what I can do. I said, see what you can do. I said, they don't, I said, they're not ill with pneumonia I had. I said, so why can't I have tea and biscuits, right? She said, well, I'll, I'll get you some. I said, yeah, but you give them some, surely you should have, so the cosset went, ain't, ain't the hill one or whatever. I said, what would you know about the hill one? So now it's an argument. She comes back with the tea and biscuits, and he went to me anyway. He said, you didn't get, you didn't get far on this escape, did you? Right? So I don't say nothing, right? So where they've cuffed me, it was like a thing behind me, and I think I could have unscrewed it at night. Got it off, and you might have to crash one. So when my, when my, my girlfriend came with my mum, I'm whispering in her, I said, I'll be on the second floor of the first floor. She said, on the first floor. I said, is there stairs or a lift? She went, there is stairs. I went, okay. I said, I've got one more go. 
What's happened is my pal, Jimmy's little brother, he come and got me, or tried to come and get me. A guy called Tony who was a fighter and, and someone else who was a bit of a knife man. They've come down, I don't know this, I'm a kid, right? But I'm thinking, two in the morning, I want to try and undo the screw thing. They've come down, couldn't find me, and the police have been called. So in the morning, they said, you're going back to the station. I said, I've got fucking pneumonia. They went, it doesn't matter. So they take me back to the station, three in the morning, two police arrive. Take me onto the van, small van, put me on there. I said, what are you doing? Put me on there. I said, you're fucking joking, ain't you? I said, you're joking, right? Put me on like this, right? Go in the front of the van. It's a small green pan with fucking things like that. I said, there's rules. I said, you can't do this. He said, rules for you, Russell. He said, do you, do you not know the trouble you've caused? Like as if I give a fuck, but he went, do you not know the trouble you've caused? And you think the rules, you think the rules apply to you? I thought, well, it's right, isn't it, right? So I copped it sweet. And as we was driving through London, I was thinking of people in their beds, like with their missus, maybe the dog on the bed and all that. I, I, it was a vivid thought. And I remember thinking, oh, and the streets were all empty. It was just empty. So we arrive at this gaff, now I'm cuffed me, put me in a cell. He said, no, he can't, he has to be at the end cell. And no one's to open him unless you're two-handed. So I think I've had three escapes now, yeah? No, not yet. I've had two. Yeah. I've had two. Well, right now. So, in the next day, I've got my food. I said, my food's not hot enough. I want to eat it up. So, Cosa, like young Cosa, older than me, went, we can't eat it up. I said, don't tell me you can't eat it up. I said, I said you would want your own food eated up. I know what you like or your tea. I said, you'll have a, a, a um, one of them things, that a microwave. I said, you'll have a microwave here. And he fucks off. He eats my food up. I said, we do my tea. I said, why I'm arguing. The key tea's gone cold, right? I mean, he's taking the piss. I said, mate, I said, you look, you either look after him, mate, so you don't. We're 20 handed in the cells because it's all overcrowded. So I'm back in the, with, with kids here, right? So anyway, like 10 of them, 20 of them. So I didn't have biscuits. I said, where's my dessert? I know you get a dessert. So he's, he's got the ump. So this is, he's gone back and talked about all this. So all of a sudden, about nine in the morning, an old school, school kick it to death slaggo comes he, he pulls down the thing he's about 45 50 sergeant he went with his with his trunger. he said let me tell you right he said you're in south london now not fucking halifax or whatever because they've also got your report I'm a mithering cunt, you know what I mean? I'm always moaning about something and driving him mad, right? So he's, I know he's got the report when he knows that I've driven him mad. He says, see you, one more word out of you, son. He said, you'll get the hiding of your life and then we'll take you to hospital. He puts up the fucking thing, right? So, so an hour goes by. So two hours goes by. So I get on a buzzer. Cosa comes, I said, get the sergeant here, please. He said, what's it about? I said, I want to apologise to him. <coughs> so he comes down, opens the thing, piss in his face. The next geezer, phew, I don't get him in the boat, I get him there. So now I'm expecting to get killed, right? It wasn't that I was the toughest kid. It was just I'm arguably the most determined, right? I don't know why I've done it, but I've done it. So I've called it on, right? They don't come for me. So I had a pen in my hand, and I'm like that. For, I couldn't sleep. All of a sudden, door opens. I'm thinking I'm going to get bad. They threw piss, like what they pissed in the urn. <sniffs> Missed me. But I couldn't, I couldn't sit comfortably. I had to lay on the floor, which is more vulnerable. So they come the next day. They went, listen, you can behave yourself. You can go on association with everyone else, but you've got to behave yourself, right? So I come out on association. That was it. So now they come for me for the scrubs. I'm in a van and they cuff me like this. So I thought, fuck it. Oh, well, I can kick that door. So all the way, when we get to Chelsea, I start kicking the door. They say, don't do that, don't do that, Russ, don't do that. I don't stop kicking the fucking door, right? It don't go. When I get to the scrubs, they're all lined up. Big Vicar's son, Larry Cunt, Scapes, <laughs> thing. They're all lined up. So I go on the wing. They didn't batter me or nothing, but it was like, they're looking at me. When I come out, <laughs> my first court appearance, next court appearance, right? I had murders with the screws on the reception. They said, you better not come back. I said, I'm fucking coming back. When I come back, they battered me, right? <laughs> go back to the wing. Didn't get nicked, but they battered me, right? Go back to the wing. 
Nicky Dunford's there, who got nicked with the most wanted robber in, in the country at the time. He was there. Uh, There's a couple of murderers. Winston Silcott was there somewhere, knifed off on the other wing. And my dad had done a book with him. So I start getting nicked on the wing. Verbal abuse, all different things. I go to the block, lose my TV, didn't get a TV, you had no phone calls and you had no toilet in your cell then, a slop out. So I was always in trouble. So on a visit, I said to my mate Gary and Kevin, I said, I can escape. I said, I need to know the exit from the court left where it goes. Is that on remand? This is on remand now, right? I've worked something out, which I'll get to. Mm -hmm. So I said, what goes right, what goes left? So the next visit, they said, you go across. You need to go left, Russ. Right, you're walking to loads of police and all this, right? You need to go left. So I said, I explained to them how, how, how I would do it. So what was happening, what was this? When I'm going to court, they put you in cuffs and the squad who deal with the E-cat, I don't think I was A-cat then, I was pot A. They put you in the, the, the van, they have an escort behind and one in front. And they drive you to the court. So as we're going there, the cause has got all fucking stories about if we nearly had you here, we nearly had you in isn't he said. He said, we was 30 handed son, right? He said, you fucking walk past us with an hat and a fucking pair of glasses. And he said, it was only when you got in the car, he said, but our car's all facing the wrong way. But whenever I go somewhere, I'll it faced the way that is not, can't get caught in traffic or it's further away where it's, you've got a chance of driving off straight away. He said, one of us got on you. He said, you just drove off to, to the thing. He said, we had you that many times. He said, we couldn't believe how lucky you was, right? That's what he said to me, right? So anyway, when we go to the court, it's a shutter. <laughs> All right. You come up, I'm cuffed, but if you was on a normal routine, you walk up and you just walk to your cell. They just go, go to the cells, lad, and you choose any cell. But I'm on an E-list. So when we get to the top, he uncuffs me. I can hear the thing going like that, open. But he shuts the door. All right. He shuts the door. So I can't run, so I thought. Right. So then they say, what cell is he going? They've got to designate a cell for an A or an E, man. So I'm standing by the door, whereas if I was normal routine thing, I know now the van goes out and it's waiting for more sweat boxes and the same routine it drives out and another sweat box comes in. All different kids coming in, about 20 kids. So I said to my solicitor, produce me every week. So they said, Mr. Grant wants to be uh, produced every week. So what happens is I get produced every week and I said to my pals, within 10 weeks, that, that door at the top will be open. But there's two causes that I couldn't work out how I would barge two causes out of the way. Anyway, on about the third week, I go and I take, my dad sent me this book in called The Unbearable Likeness of Being, right? Because he's an intellectual, right? He sent this book in. So what, I, this is, this is, we get to the top, I hear the thing going shut. The door is open, which they should have shut, right? And he uncuffs me, right? And I'm standing there, but there's two of them. So I says, I've got a book in there. Uh, I said, have a look. So he's gone, he's gone over to the book and he's gone, fucking hell, that's a, it was on top of my, my, my property, like my, my gear that I had. He's gone over. He said, fucking hell, that's a, a thing in book. But I said, yeah, my dad sent it in, right? So he's had a little thing like that. I said, I'll just show you something. So as I walk across, this cause I stand still, a bolt. Shut the door, shut the door. And there was a screw there called Nobby. It was an old sort of screw, right? And he knew I was a cheeky cunt, right? He was about, he was about 50, but he was like in charge of the gaff, right? So I bolt. So I'm running down the stairs, they panic like kids. Ah, shut the door, shut the door, shut, shut the gate. But it don't matter, the fucking gate is like that, it shuts like that. First geezer, bang. <clears throat> he hits the deck. Second geezer, this is not a punch or anything. I barge him out of the way. But the third geezer had a little bit more class than the other two, right? I got past them, the door is like three quarters open. I'm free. I can see the street. I'm free. And what he'd done, he was 60, he was, he was, twi he was twice the age of these other guys. He, 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 he didn't stand in front of me. He put his foot out and I caught his foot. He bashed his head and got four stitches, right? I didn't punch him. He fell against the van. He, his head fucking wavered, right? I fell into the street and as I hit the deck, because he's coming in perfect. If he was over there, he wouldn't have got me. And if he was there, I would have held onto him, I wouldn't have fallen. 
he just kicked me right in the fucking, like, like, like perfect. So I'm like that. <laughs> they jump on me ten-handed and they can't believe they was like, like that. I'm gutted, I'm fucking sick. Because I, I swear to you, I fell over. I didn't fall over, I stumbled. It was a stumble. So it, that's how I get caught. So basically, cut a long story, go back to the scrubs. And I'm getting nicked for things all the time. It's a naughty block. So the most violent screws I ever come across was at the scrubs. 20 of them get extra chart. 20 of them go to court one day, three years later. And some of them go to prison. Those are the most violent, horrible cunts. So... I've gone down the block about six times. I've done two months block, block done bother me, right? And it's escalating. But on one of the nickings, this is the funniest nicking. I've, my mum's given me some clothes. There's a 50p in the thing. I just left it on the side. I get nicked for it, go down the fucking block. And the PO in charge hated me. And he used to almost shake at, at looking at me, right? So he's standing behind the governor and he's going, he's going on about the red writing on me, you know, like this trouble, that trouble. And he went, 50p, what's your explanation? I said, what happens is the tooth fell out, Governor. So put it under the pillar. He went, yeah. I said, the tooth fairy left the 50p, right? So they've all got the ump screws. But the Governor found it funny. He went, all right, great. He said, look, go back. So I was going to give you three days. He said, but I'll tell you what, go back. He said, but don't, please don't be down here in the next fucking week. He didn't swear. Off I go. I take a lot of nickings. I do about three months block, right? I'm only a kid. And I never got dragged to the block. It was only three times that they, I said, I don't need the cuffs, I'll walk. I'm, I'm, I'm 24 and the biggest troublemaker on the wing by far. So this was, this was my plan. Scaffolding coming. So I said to seven, eight men, we'll climb up on the scaffold on the roof and I'll smash the roof off if we don't get our demands met, which is basically less brutality and other things, right? So they're all robbers. Tell them your stuff. Murderers, this, that, and the other. So, I just wait. So we're getting ready with it all. And the day before, we're about to go on 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 the on the roof because it was just scaffold. You you had to pull some some metal framing away. This is on the, the prison yard, right? Like I, I saw with someone who was a bad, bad fucking. Like I don't want to say what he'd done to to, to some to someone. He was terrible. I bashed him on the on the yard. The screws went, didn't drag me off, right? I, I've had incidents. So Mickey, who's a robber, he's, as I've come up with my dinner, we're, we're 12 hours away, the next morning when I go on the roof, the screw's going, fucking, he's give, give, giving him the every treatment. So I can't be on him. I nudged him. Are we getting there, you cunt? I said, go and fight him. So he's jumped out. He's going, I'll fight you, Grant, right? So I've gone up to him. I've just kicked him here. He's hit the penny. And now the worst screws I've ever met and they're on their way up, right? So I jump in the, the, the thing. You could move your beds over and you could get the end off. The, the end of things like a stick, like a metal thing. We smash a few things in the thing. Me and Mickey are behind the thing and they come up and they're mob-handed and they're now going to get killed. Because you get killed there for giving them cheek anyway. But I sort of got away with it a bit. And I see the PO like that. And I think we're gone. So there was a there was a screw there who was in charge of the self-defense. He was a judo or something champion. And he was a polite man. He wasn't a bully, this man. He comes to the front of the thing, they're all behind him on the other side. He went, Grant, he said, if you go now, I promise you can walk. I said, if, I, if, if me or him get done, I said, you have my word, I will never ever leave it. I will come back. He went to me, man to man, you can walk to the block. I threw the thing down with the bed, I come out. They marched me along and they put me in the downstairs cell. They come in 15 and <laughs> right? So I was, I was nervous, you know what I mean? I thought, I didn't think they'd do me, but I thought, if they're going to, and the, the PO went to me, if you ever come on this wing again, he said, I will have you. Now what he'd done at, at the Lambeth, he'd cuffed a kid round a, 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 a post and beat him with a, a truncheon for 20 minutes, this cunt. So I go to the block, and I'm now on good order and discipline, being subversive, and I can't go on the wing no more. That's it. There's people in the block on the circuit who basically are in for more, not more serious things, but... So what they said was, he's going to smash the roof up, right? 
It must have been the grass somewhere, not on the amen, but other people, about 50 people knew, you know what I mean? We was going to go up. And he was going to take prison hostages, staff hostages. Well, that's not right. How would you, how would you take hostages onto a roof? A load of bollocks, right? But that keeps me on what you call. So the governor comes down. He says, before this had happened, when I come down on one of the cases, he went to me, this governor, when they come around, they open the door and say, good morning, morning. He went to me, why are you here? I said, what had happened? Not that incident, something else. And he went, he said, when you go on the nick, and he went, you're coming here all the time. He said, you're mixing with, because you go on the yard with other inmates who was on the block, IRA geezer I met, who'd done 28, he was a warrior. I met some real proper people, right? He said, he said, you're probably looking at three, four, five years. He said, he said, you said you're going to end up on a circuit on a four stretch or five stretch. He said, why, why, why are you putting yourself in this situation? Now I'm back. He's just given up on me now. There's no fucking hope. Right. So someone in the thing I wanted to have done, he was a uh, uh, multiple fucking rapist or something. And I'm giving the orders from, from bits of paper. They intercept a bit of paper and they've had enough, right? So what happened was they said, listen, you're going to fucking Brixton. Now, Nicky Dumford said to me, they largo, largo all you up and you, you sort of go like that. You, you end up very, you end up fucked up. You end up like a fucking spastic for a couple of weeks. They've, they've hung a geezer there and all that. So the taffy screw come down to me and said, Russ, please listen to me. Please don't carry on there like you have here. He said, they will fucking kill you or do something to you and you won't be the same again, son. So when you go there, please don't get in trouble like you have here, right? I said, sweet, Gov, yeah? The van comes. I'm off. I'm off to a fucking bad gaff, right? And I'm not coming out of the block. I'm fucked. So I go to the thing. I'm only a kid, you know what I mean? 24. He says, um, I get to the block. They arrive 12 handed. They're over there. And I... I looked up, I was cleaning my plate or something, I was doing something. I mean, he went, all right, he said, listen, they give you one chance. So we'd say to the government, you can go on the wing. He said, because we think it was only the ones on the wing you was in conflict with, all right? He said, we're going to tell you this. If you come back here, you will regret it. So he said to me, go in front of the governor. Governor went on the wing. So I hope I don't see you down here like all this. I've had about 10, 12 nickings, 10 nickings. I've done three months block, right? Block don't, don't, don't bump over me, mate. I, with, or, with a radio or without, but they give you a thing. But what had happened was, they should take your mattress out. And I should sit on a pipe. And by the time I'd done so much block, it, it's really tiring, I, I've got piles. And the pain that you would get sometimes is excruciating. And I had it for about two years. So it was dangerous. So don't sit on, on a pipe. And years later, if I was sat on wet ground, it would hit me, but the pain, the sharp pains, it's like fucking unbearable. So that was a mistake. I, I, I didn't know that. So I go on the wing and the first night the light wouldn't turn off. I thought I'm going to smash the fucking light, but you don't get many chances in prison. You have to take it because... Yeah, especially if you're escaping every chance you get. Is this all still in demand? Yeah, I haven't done. <laughs> That's what, this is all in the first nine months of my jail. I ain't done, I've done four months before, mm -hmm. right? And this is like, all in nine months, I've escaped three times and I've had all the egg, right? So I was going to smash the thing, but I thought, please, you know, don't. So I didn't. So a screw's coming along. He said, that red light. I said, listen, you, right? I said, the fucking light don't, don't, it don't turn off. I said, you've put me here on purpose. So I smashed the light. I said, just flash the fucking light on my face. So he went, okay. Next morning, it was the best gaffer in the world. He was so chilled. So anyway. Gary Wilson, who was at the Scrubs, used to work with Fraser, all right? You'd never get on him, he's a bit like Ferris, very small guy, polite. I get to the, when I get there, he's, his thing is all sealed off, right? So, Ron Easterbrook, as I'm going to church, he knows my, what I call my, my uncle, Billy Gentry. Now, Billy Gentry, He's not my uncle, but he married my dad's sister. He does 18 years out of 18 years, right? He does six out of 10. No, 10 out of 15, and afterwards, he gets a fucking, does six out of 10. So he's hardcore, right? While I'm on the trot, 
I meet this geezer called Ron Easter, but what do you think he's done? He's got Semtex, he's a double A man. He's, no, he's single A man, he's got Semtex. And when the, he put it at the thing and blown the, the top of the, you know, you get a, a thing that opens an emergency mm -hmm. hatch. Yeah, like a sunroof. Yeah, like a sunroof. I know someone who kicked it out. So he had long legs, but he could kick, he kicked it, kicked it, kicked it. He got it out and he got it out of the scrubs as they pulled in, right? But he got caught 10 minutes later down the road. So he said to me, if you kick things, they can go, right? So anyway, Easterbrook has blown, blown the thing, but he couldn't, he didn't do the bolt. So he's now double A. As I see him, I see him in the, I'd had a late night with him, like to seven in the morning, him in Gentry, right? I remember when we come out of this gaff, he was driving, I was thinking, fuck it, hell, I hope we don't get stopped. There's no way we was going to jail the three of us, you know what I mean, right? So anyway, I said, oh, I've run. I said, fucking hell. He went, I said, mate, I said, you blew it. I was, I was like in awe, you know what I mean? Like, I said, fucking hell. And like, I went like that through the thing. I said, lovely to see you. He said, good luck at court, son. So when they take me to court, I go with a geezer called Gigi, who'd done the, he'd done like a 20 mil out of the, uh, the, um, the safety deposit gaff. Here was um, Wilson and I'm here. So I'll give Gigi a pen, I go in the court, and it's 96 grand, I've got it down to 96 grand, right? It wouldn't matter if it's 200 grand, 300 grand, 100 grand, it's all the same thing. So what What? The, what he said, he said, you're going to do four years. He, oh, he liked my, my, my girlfriend, she spoke for me. Um, he didn't like my mum so much because he knows yeah, my dad and all that, you yeah. know, he was polite. So what happens is, I says, look, he says, look, he says, you're going to do four years, right? He says, so you can apply for pro after two. He went, this is what he said to my barrister. He said, I'm not, uh, he said it's not the, um, it's not the traveler. He said, it's not the unsigned traveler's check. Cause they said, this is all part of a million pound thing. And he was part of a firm. It wasn't part of a firm, just me and one geezer, but they made it sound worse than what he was. He went, no, nah. and he was right. He said, what concerns me is the, is the book and cards. He said he's, he's been going out every day since he's whatever age, over a two year period, religiously. He said, this I'm very concerned about. He didn't care about the, the unsigned and the big thing, it's all this and that. He wasn't, didn't give a fuck about that, right? And the other thing about traveler's checks is you pay halfway and I was giving half, half of the profit away. So it sounds like it's a lot, it's not. I've probably done about a quarter of a meal's worth in, in reality, but Tra booking cards, I've done more, or not more, but as much, and it's all my money. You know what I mean? Like, say, I, I, you know, but they don't get all the stuff back, right? So, the booking card stuff, he knew I was going out every single day to a bank, and he didn't like that. With, with the travel ships, you might go one day there, a few weeks, and another day there. It's not every day, and that's what he got the ump about. So, anyway, I now go to Wandsworth, and everyone said to me, You must be careful at Wandsworth, they will kill you, right? So, I arrive at Wandsworth. And I had my top button done up on my stripy shirt. I thought, fucking need this geezer. Right. And we go through. A little fella come in. Here in our grant. I gov, right? I didn't want no trouble with him. I was told they was worse than, than scrubs. They wasn't, but they was. He pulled out a little blade, like a little, like a, not a flick knife, but a pen knife, a couple of inches long. He starts going into, into the wood on, on the side. He's saying, one visit a month. Food is terrible. And if you fuck around here, they will batter you. Like proper beat you. He said, you ain't been bad. Yeah, something like that. I'll only take two batons, but he was letting me know, right? And I'm looking at him, he's doing this thing. He says, so I wish you a happy journey here, Grant. Fuck it, no, I need this geezer. He's a short guy, yeah? I go on the wing. All of a sudden, an old screw comes. He said, you want some... Um, slippers. He says, yeah, size nine. Bought me these brand new slippers. That was the only bit of kindness I got. When I go on the wing, they put me in the cell near the office. I'm eat, I'm eat up. You're always in the yellow fucking suit. Oh, that's right. The next morning, two screws come in, strip search. You get strip search once a week. He took all my photos, looking at my kid. He says, is that your bird, is it? I said, yeah. You've been good looking, isn't you? I said, yeah, right. I fucking knew I was going to hate this gaff. I hate it, right? It's like, I hated them straight away, so anyway. But it wasn't as bad as the scrubs. So anyway, I go on the wing, PO went like that. I go in the office, he went, he, he went, see this? He said, any of this here, we're coming you like a ton of bricks, you understand? I went, yeah. But I had one secret weapon, 
Billy Gentry's on the on the food thing, and they knew they called him. They, they said he's, he's his uncle. He's not my uncle. He's my auntie's ex um, husband. The two boys said I heard one of them say, "Do not spin Grant when Gentry's on the wing." So they they they, they won't fancy it with me. Done eighteen out of eighteen. You talk about Charlie Bronson. God bless him. Yeah, I have respect for Charlie. But this was the first uh, where they hosed you down with a trough at the back at the scrubs for Gentry. And it, what he was about, he's got two daughters. One is not he's not the father of, they're my auntie's daughters, and the other is is uh, his real daughter. They wouldn't let him see the other daughter. And he fought them to the death, got smashed to pieces, smashed screws, but it went on forever. So he's the equivalent of Fraser. So Fraser's in the jail doing three and a half stretch, right? So Thank you. Yeah, he got three and a half. When he come out, he got a three and a half stretch for something, right? While I'm on the trot, I meet him at a gaff, and I say, oh, I said, Frankie, it, it was just in someone's office, like a manager of a, of a nightclub. I said, I'm, uh, I said, you know my mum? He said, what's your mum's name? I said, uh, Sheila McVicker. He went, yo, oh. he said, hello, boy. He said, how's your dad? I said, all right. I said, I've still got the, mum. he gave my mum a tenner, which was a lot then, when I was born. And she bought some, some bonds, like, numbers type things and we still got them <laughs> so I said we still got the bonds my mum bought a tenner I said Did you give my mum a tenner he didn't really like my dad too much right but he had mutual respect right? my dad said it was game it was game but he was like Richardson gang my dad don't get on the Richardson's anyway so he's there I speak to him and I have a shower so I'm off to have a shower and I'm pretty quick in the shower so I have the shower I've just got all the suds off me all of a sudden the shower goes off after three minutes. There's a kid with all suds. Like suds. Screw it, no, we wiped them off. So that's the gaff you're in. The food was terrible, right? You had beans, curried beans on a Monday and, and, and a paste, that, a, a, like a paste thing. It was terrible. It was awful, awful gaff. But I never really got in any trouble there. I got nicked once. And I end up next door to Mickey Adams, right? When I come off the book, I end up not, he's always getting nicked and we become pals. So what happens, we get sent to, where do we get sent to? Is this still again on demand? No, I'm, I'm just, I'm on my first two months. I'm on my first five months as convicted. What did you get? I got four years, maybe do two and a half. It mm -hmm. depends if you've got parole, which I- got. And in your mind, you're still thinking of trying to escape instead of just- No, not it. then, because- Did you just accept that you were in then? There's no point really. Uh, Gentry was going to try and make one from, from one hour. And I said, well, I'll come with you. He said, but you'll probably get the parole, so why go? And my door was near, my door was near the office. The kid said to me, that's the worst cell. He said, they come here. If it goes off, they come in there straight away. But he said, don't get a, 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 a con. He said, don't get in trouble here. He said, they come straight away. But you're still looking to do the tours at any time? After being sent, no, no, there's no point. There, there was no point. What was your mum saying to it when you, when she sees her boy getting sentenced four and a half years, four years? Like, no, my mum's up for it. My mum always said, she said, did she say that the resemblance with you and your dad with kind of going down the same path? Well, she couldn't have dreamt what was up ahead because of the escapes. Yeah, you know, she, she said to me, look, if the screws do sound to you and all that, like they're brutal, doesn't mean to say you've got to be brutal back. Said, but stand up to them. But it doesn't mean to say because they take a liberty, you, you should then do something violent back. She said, because just because they're a bad man, don't make say so you've got to become a bad man. She didn't want my, my, my dad to, to smash screws and everything. I mean, he's, he's a fire, he's a tough cunt, and he hates them. I didn't hate him in the same way, but I'm, I'm more happy go lucky than my dad. My dad's like more sort of shallow and sort of, he's cold. I'm not like that. But my mum said, don't be, don't turn into, she didn't say an animal, but don't start smashing screws on the head with tools, is what she meant. Did she say there was a possibility you can down that route though, with all the escapes and? No, she didn't see all that, but she knew as a kid, like, I, I could be a bit of an handful sometimes, like, very young, but I was pretty good from seven onwards, but she always sensed that with me. She didn't think I'd be a criminal. She didn't know I was such a, I only got caught shoplifting once and I cried because my mum was really upset. She was an honest woman. I had a nan and granddad nearby. You know, honest people. My granddad was a window clean. We weren't a criminal family, but my mum's going out with John McVicker. Before that, she was going out with Falco. 
So she knew proper gangsters. She knew Frankie Fraser. Frankie Fraser likes my mum. My dad don't like Frankie Fraser, but he respects him. He said he's very brave. See, when you were in prison, was your dad in contact with you? Was he telling you to try and screw the head, or was he just kind of accepting no, he don't, who he you don't were? No, he don't say screw the head. But we, I can't remember if we was talking then. He sent me a letter. He got stopped in a car, drunk, and he just ran off. And he'd give himself in the next morning. And the cosa said, because if you, my dad knows a few little tricks like this, right? The cosa went, if that's what you can do drunk, Mr. McVicker, I, would like, I wouldn't like to see what you can do sober. He said, we're not going to waste our time with him. If, you, if, they, if they talk to you, if you let them talk to you, you're in their custody. But if you just get out of the car and run, you're not. So there's nothing illegal in it. <laughs> and I remember him sending that in the, in, in the letter to me, right? So I was writing to him, but I can't remember what happened after that. And I certainly wouldn't tell him all the things. I wouldn't tell him all the trouble. He, would, he wouldn't like that. So I now me and Mickey Adams go to a gaff. So when we get there, he's being split up for me, but they give him the right act because his brother, Patrick, on a seven, he smashed a screw on the nose, broke his nose. And he was, on my, he was on the wing, I was, so he's gone the other wing. I said, see, see you later, Mickey, right? Anyway, they said, uh, workshop. I said, my Lord, oh, I've, got a, I've got a single cell. I said, a single cell, I've got a booking on all the rules. While I'm down the block, I'm meeting all these fucking older people, and I've got a booking on all the rules. I nicked them over not hot enough food, not hot enough in the cell, not getting uh, a, time, a, a timed hour. There's all different rules, and I learned all these rules. And when I got the book in, which was through a guy who my dad knew indirectly, they went, it's down the block. Oh, it's, it's going to take us to the next level. I drove them mad. Down the block, right? So everywhere I go, I'm this act. So I get to this film, get my single cell, right? Which was nice of them. And I remember the bit of fish. It was like fish and chips. And I, I, I can remember the fish. I'd never tasted fish in a year, roughly, like that. It was no grease. No grease, it was big portions. I couldn't believe it. It was unbelievable. If you knew how bad the food was at once, it was terrible. And if you've got six slices, it's going to take the first three slices off. Grant, take them off. You'd have to throw them in the bin. Because you needed them to make your peanut butter sandwiches. Anyway, me and Adams get split up. I said, no, I'm allergic to dust. He went, I'm allergic to you. You're going maximum security. He said, you're not going to drive. He says that to the words. You're not going to drive us mad here. So... I'm there. There's an old boy screw, but he sort of found me funny. I'm cuffed to the screw and we're off to Albany. Johnny Dunford's there. Winston Silcock, the cop killer. You heard of Winston Silcock? Yeah. yeah. He was innocent, you know that, didn't you? Right. So anyway. He'd been down the block, so I'd never seen him. He was next door to me, but he was at Albany. Jimmy Dill, the robber. Ricky Peters, the drug dealer. The IRA geezer who was one of the Guildford or one of the something four. Guildford Four. Or the other mob. Birmingham Six. Oh, I was the Guildford Four, I think, right? So he, Jimmy Dill said to me, he never got out. He got out that year. He won the appeal and he went on to marry one of the Kennedys. So he was there. I said, running races. So first thing I get there, there's a fucking a rapist or someone on the, on, on, on the spur. So I said, mate, you, I said, mate, you can't be next to me. So you go tomorrow, you go. You go to hospital. Someone had been there a day, this geezer's gone, right? Don't know where he went, numbers probably, right? So I'm mean, only there a day. But what was funny, it was really cosy, like a beautiful atmosphere, really positive people. And I'm a breath of fresh air because I'm doing a four stretch. They're all a little bit heavy, you know, with it, right? Good footballers. Jimmy Deal was a brilliant footballer, real class act. Like, oh, he was a great footballer, real classy. Winston Silcott was a good footballer. I used to have running races, chess matches. I wasn't the best chess player, but I used to me and this Ricky. So anyway, I, I, when I arrived, the governor said to me, he said, look, he said, we don't want you here. He said, you're doing four years. He said, I've got one other inmate, right, who's doing four and a half years, or three and a half years. He says, the only person doing less than you. He said, one step from here is the dregs of society. And he pointed to Parkhurst. He said, do you want to end up there? He said, you're 20, I was 25 then. He said, he said, you're probably going to get pro. He said, but do you really want to end up there with the dregs? I went, no, I don't, right? 
I said, come and keep me head down. I said, I'm allergic to dust. He went, you ain't got to go in the workshop here, but you're going on the fucking gardens. So I'm on the, on the gardens. So me and geezer called Lenny and someone else. We used to drive them mad. We used to call ourselves the tea party, right? And it become the tourists with, all, with everyone. The screws didn't want to be on the tea party. We'd, we'd do 10 minutes work. And when we was in the most public area, we'd get out a blanket, get out our tea and biscuits. And the screw would go, what are you doing? We'd say, we're having a tea break. And we'd have a tea break, right? And this is how we carried on. Right? And, um, some screws would come on. I'd go, I've drawn the short, the short straw with you lot. A fucking tea party, you know what I mean? But some of them found us funny and would give us biscuits, right? But we did graft, but we had a lot of tea breaks, right? So they called us the tea party. So after a few months, I get my pro. So he calls me in the office. He says, got your pro. I said, can I come back? He said, you, you wasn't wanted when you come here. He said, you're not, not going to come back. He said, you think I'm going to trust you coming back from a visit? He said, you're not coming back. He said, go to your cat D, keep your head down and go home on home leaves and, and maybe get a, you know, a, a, a job where you're working outside the jail. He said, you may not have time. He said, but he said, you're about to get the best chance. Some men here are going to wait 10 years for that. So make the best chance of it. So anyway, I says, thank you. Go back. When it's time to go, my two mates come up to come and get me. I don't go down to the gate. I'm saying goodbye to everyone. It was really emotional. You know, these people are doing such a long time. I, I, I felt really uh, hurt for them. You know, it wasn't like, people you live with you kind of know and they was all gentlemen anyway I get to the gate a PO went to me he said I have a good mind to send you back he said you see you he said he said your mates have been waiting here he said your mum's probably waiting for you he said and I'm thinking of sending you back he said there won't be no home visit he said you ain't out of jail yet he said you're giving it a big and I said I was just saying goodbye to my friends club he said never mind about that he said you're a wind up he said you should have been down here an hour ago and I thought at that time, don't get in no You can't keep strong in it. Anyway, I go off, I go on my town visit. So first thing I do, I get my mate to see a doctor. So I've got a bad back. So I go on, so I've got a bad back. My mum said, fucking hell, can't you go and do your bird? What's the, what's the problem with you, right? You're only doing a four stretch, right? I said, no, I can't do my bird, man, right? So now there's murders, right? The cosmos come round. I said, I've got a bad back, right? My mate, I think Jimmy was there and his missus, they're laughing. The cosmos fucking just went. After a week of it, my mum went, listen, we started arguing. I said, I'll fucking go back then, mum. I said, but listen, I could have stayed here a month. So don't, you're not, she's just not the way to do it. She said, go and play football, do whatever you're doing, but don't, you're just taking the piss out of them all the time, <laughs> right? So anyway, I go back to the thing. They went, oh, nice to, nice to meet you, Russell. He said, we've heard a lot about you, son. He said, go on. He said, we wish you luck anyway. I said, thank you, governor, right? It was really polite. Go on the wing, anyway. I wouldn't, Adams, he had a trick with the shoes. They was always getting his shoes off him, but he had a way of getting them through the doctor. So I'd done the same trick. So I had shoes, didn't have shoes. They put me in a potato factory. So fuck the fuck potato factory. I used to just bunk off, sit in the sun. So this woman governor comes down with her mate. She says, Grant, what are you doing? I said, I'm sunbathing. She said, yeah, you're supposed to be at work. I said, no. I'm allergic to dust. She said, dust in a potato factory. I said, there's dust. I said, it, dirt, dust, it's all the same thing. I'm not, I said, you know the, the, the trouble I've had over the, the thing. I said, so why are you putting me in the dustiest job of the thing? All right? She went, you, you're not supposed to have your trainers. She went, anyway, I'll sort out a job for you. All right? So she's with another woman. I said, who's she? Right? They was both dressed up like going to a nightclub sort of thing. I said, who's she? She went, she's my friend. I said, you're an official. She said, no. I said, so why are you... Um, bringing her around, looking at cons for like condemned men and you're in charge of us. So when you've got a lot of yap, off she walks, right? Anyway, I get a job on, on the wing. Cleaner. I have one incident there. Geezer nicks my walkman, right? I couldn't believe it when I found out who it was. So <laughs> go on the thing, 10 handed, give him a few dicks, kick him out of the ass. I said, leave the jail. So the next day, there's a, someone can you still here? So get a shovel. I said, listen, you've got to go, lad. I said, you can't nick people's gear and stay. He said, go one way or the other. And he went. That was the only bit of ag I had. But the kid who told me, I see him getting bullied by two screws, giving him a strip search for no reason. And I thought it was good enough to tell me about the walkman, who the kid was, right? He didn't do it for, for the trouble. He just did. Oh, he got my walkman back, the kid. He went, there's your walkman. I said, who did it come? He said, I'm not going to tell you that. He said, because don't, I know you're battering I said, and he ended up telling me. Anyway, so I see him getting bullied. So I come into the school, I said, fucking leave him alone and all that anyway. They nicked me. 
and they shanghai me out of jail so i'm now on the way to uh pentonville it's a piss hole so when i get there i ain't got a single cell so this is funny there's a screw there like that long dark hair to here right and his sidekick right called rambo so you can imagine right so I'm dealing with Rambo now. I said, I want to fight. He said, listen, we don't care about you. I said, I'm doing four stretch. I said, there's people doing six months and three months. I don't know Roy Shaw's there. He's already got his single cell, right? <laughs> you, want to, you don't want to be taking your single cell off him, right? He says, only two on the ring. You ain't getting one, right? He said, we don't give a fuck about you. So I just, as I go, I slam the door. It goes, Pum. nothing happens. So I'm down the next, on the Monday, with my book, my rules book, to the SO. I said, I was going to tell you now, I said, the, the, the food's not hot enough. I've gone through six things that I've spotted. I said, and I will drive you mad. I said, I'll get you a single cell. He said, but that book goes away. I went, sweet, right? I get my single cell. I don't get nicked. It, it, was, it, was, it was very difficult to get nicked. I got nicked once at Wandsworth. I think they would have killed me. And the governor went, He's fuck, he hasn't been in trouble all the time he's been. He went, you kept your head down. He said, but if you come down again, and there were screws, there was a screw there, like shaking. Right. To do you? It, no, no grounding to intimidate me. Mm -hmm. When I go, this is quite funny, when I go to uh, the, the sea cat with Adams, when they take me for thing, he was on the escort and uh, he shit himself. It's me and Adams looking at him and he's, he, he was going, he knocked down and all that, right? And two boys said to me, you heard one of them say something like, fucking hell, Grant and Adams are on the same escort, right? But we're both doing a fall. You're not gonna, if you use violence for an escape, you'll get more jail. You know, you'll get two years more. So anyway, I'm there at this gaff. I've got my single cell. I had three months to go. What's happened? I've gone on a town visit. I've come back drunk, paralytic, and they've put me in the hospital wing, and then a double cell, lost my single cell. Roy Shaw's there by this time, right? So I went over to him and said, John McVicker's saying, it was nice to meet your son, right? So I used to walk around with him every day, right? So he... I'm trying to think what, what happened, what, where, where I was in, in, in the story. Yeah, Roy Shaw, you only had three months to go. Yeah, three, I've got three months to go and I'm in a double cell. I haven't been nicked, but in my cell was a picture of, 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 of a, a beautiful a uh, girl that I knew, yeah, like, she was like a girlfriend. She wasn't my Swedish girl, she was someone else, right? And they'd ripped the photo up, and I just thought it'd been nicked by mistake or misplaced. So I'm getting my canteen one day, and the kid come out, like, I've only been back two days or whatever from, from the hospital. He went, look, I found that in the in the bin. I had sugar. I, 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 I went, Phew! I said, you fucking slags. I'm like, like, really loud. I come to any hand, it all around me. So you're gonna walk to a block? I said, yeah. I didn't even say what it's about. They knew, but I didn't say it down the block or nothing. Three days choke, I come out. All of a sudden, the PO comes up to me. He said, you know you was going home in three weeks time? I said, yeah. He said, you're not going home now. You're going home in a year and three weeks time. So what are you talking about? He said, when you're nicked, we have to send the report off to the parole board. He says, so it's up to them what they do. I get a letter back from the parole board. It basically said this. We never knew you was nicked at the DCAT. You're showing the exact same behaviour that we thought you was reformed from, right? If you start off bad and end up good, you'll get parole. If you start off good and end up bad, you don't get parole. He said, we're losing you three weeks. So instead of going home on the 1st, I've gone on the 22nd. So they said, one more thing, that's it. So... I was going to move into another cell, but I had to wait, a double cell, with a guy who played chess. And the guy I'm with, he does a pony. He's a bit insane, you know, like ill guy. He's done a pony and the gaff's done. So I kicked the door. It was only five minutes before thing. I kicked the door, kicked the door. So I opened the door. It's a screw, right? I said, let me get a mop bucket. And he went, I'll be back. Screw comes back, opens the fucking door. It's Rambo. Right? I'm going home in about two and a half weeks, two weeks by now, whatever it is. Sweet. So I give the fucking mop to the kid, right? Don't have a gut him in a bad way. And I go out, 
I said, I said something like, I want another cell. He went, you're going back in there. I shouldn't have said it. I should have just kept my fucking mouth shut. So now I go to the end of the wing and I wait at the end. And Rambo comes down and it's unlocked now. We've got 10 minutes. It's a Friday night. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking, I can see him, he's going, nah. He's, this time I can see him, he's going, nah. And his mates are going, they're trying to reason it. They don't want it. I'm thinking, I can't bang up because I've said it. You can't say it and then not do it. So I thought, I shouldn't have said nothing. Anyway, a taffy screw comes along, right? Biggest lump, bit of a, you know, they wasn't bullies there, right? But, you know, they, they was only dealing with people doing three months or six months. And I could see Rambo and they're eight-handed. And I'm thinking, I'm fucked. I'm going to, what am I going to say to my mum? Anyway, he went, come here, Boyle. I said, look in the cell. He said, never mind your fucking cell. He said, come on, I've got your cell. He went, in there, saved me a year. He went, go in that cell there. He put me with another kid. They wouldn't have done it, but this, this taffy screw did. So about a year later after I was out, and I bumped into him. I was around, because I'm around the Angel a lot. I drove around the back and I see him. I went in a small world and he, he was a bit shocked. I should have said to him, thank you. I wasn't polite enough, to be honest. I should have said, him, God, thank, thank you for that what you've done, but I didn't. I should have done. Aren't you? I thought it, you? Just it was immature. You should be, you know, he, he saved me a year, but I said to him, small world, then it? I know, I might have been with a girlfriend or something, but I should have said to him, listen, thank you. You know what I mean? I should have done that. You know, it's like, it's immaturity, really. You know what I mean? So he saved me a year. So I come out and Fred's uncle picked me up, my mum. Oh, no, I'm not finished. So on the day before the 1st of November, I still think I've got three weeks. They come and got me and they said, uh, reception. All right? So I said, yeah. what for? See the doctor, I said, what for? He said, your release papers are going on tomorrow. I said, yeah, thanks very much. Right? So I go out. The three weeks they've added on, they forgot about it. So I've signed for the thing, done the medical thing, come back to the cell, said goodbye to my mates. I take the kids, I said, they're fucking muggy cunts. I said, don't tell too many people. I said, I'll just go in the morning in case they tumble. So in the morning, I say goodbye to everyone. I go to the door. As I go, Rambo's right there with his sidekick. So I looked at him, bolt over. I said, Gov Grant. <laughs> No. I said, yeah, Grant. I said, I'm going home. He said, not according to this. I said, no, Rambo's done me. <laughs> I'm fucking, they would have mooded it. They fucking set me up. I feel I'm going home. I ain't going home, right? So I come out, Johnny, uh, Tony Dunford was there. Good fighter, Tony. Yeah. I said, what's, what's Rambo doing? He said, he's talking. I said, they've done me crooked. So I go to the SO's office. I said, I was told I was going home. I ain't going home. He said, Grant. He said, when I find out who's down to, he said, there'll be trouble. I said, no. I said, what goes around comes around. I said, don't worry about it. He said, well done for holding it down. I said, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going home for a year, right? And that was it. And when I went home, I went home on the 22nd November and um, I didn't know that up ahead, I was going to end up, me and Kenny Noy, the most two wanted people in the country, and it would be for armed robberies. And that was really the beginning of my criminal career. How long were you out for before you got the big one? I'm out at 26, I went away at 33. So you were out for a good three years? But basically what happens is, I get nicked and I escape again. <laughs> I'm surprised they even let you out the block with the amount of escapes you've done. No, and the I, successful I, I, ones. I was never double A and never had any help. You know, it's a statement then. You, 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 you know, you fucking, you probing. So I've never had no help. You know what I mean? I said, done free. This, this is when I see him. I said, like, you know, like you, I said, fair play to you. I said, but because he used to say, he used to say, you, you run and you hide. Like, a couple of times I've been nicked. He said, you can run. He said, you hide and they catch you. That was his little chip at me, right? Mm -hmm. But so from, from basically then, I, I'm at Kilburn Police Station. This is two years later. And I go for a shower. And I say to this, the, like they caught me with money from a robbery. Probably looking at five. I didn't have a gun. I, I, fret, I said I had a gun. I only got like, a small amount of money. Is anyway. this two years after you get out from no, the first sentence? No, it's, it's uh, when I'm, uh, yeah, about 28 and a half. So they come for me in the morning and they say, they're free-handed with the cuffs. I said, where's my toiletries? Because I had toiletries sent in. 
They went, Russ, we'll send it down the scrub. I'll bring it down the scrubs myself. I said, no, no, I'm not moving from the cell, right? Can't get someone on a small sweat box. It's impossible. I know because I've heard of a story where, they, where a guy that just quits putting his foot up. The dispersal will do it at maximum security prison, but these, these, they've got no chance. So they fuck off. They lock the door. They fuck off. When they come back, there's one screw there. He ain't got the cuffs. They're in a, they're in a, a rush to get the call. So they haven't followed the procedure. So it wasn't really the fact that if you don't, if you don't follow the procedure, someone like me, who's lively, would take the opportunity. Because I learned this as a kid. I told you with the marble and, and things, things that didn't work out. It, you have to, take, you get a window of opportunity to take it. Same when they give you a chance, you've got to take it. I had Johnny Steele on, they called him the mole. Yeah. He escaped from everywhere. He escaped his brother out of prison and broke him back in Listen, for a protest. I, I don't know how people do it. I couldn't get out of a prison, I've got to tell you. I, I, when I went away, I thought it was going to be like the great escape. Mm -hmm. I, I, if you left me in a prison, a B-cap prison, I wouldn't be out. A C-cap prison I could get out because you see a ladder or something. You'd need a couple of lads, but you could get a ladder and maybe get the workman to open to the wall. You get a fence, but there's more movement. But a B-cap, I couldn't get out. I'm not a... a, a I can't, I wouldn't, a B-cap prison you won't get out of. So seeing you get out the first time, was it just straight back into crime? What was your first big robbery you'd done? No, what, what, what it was, I'll, I'll go into that, what it was, when I came out, I was very careful. So I done. I only done traveller's checks that was from abroad or certain things. But what happened to me was, I was very unfortunate. I got, I got, I done a check fraud in a betting shop. I remember my mum saying to me afterwards, if you're going to do something, make it worthwhile. My mate's got me out and said, you want to go and get some readies? I said, fucking hell. I was tired. I was going to stay in bed. I've gone down to Chelsea. Two causes have arrived. I've hit one. It's gone down. I've got out. And the woman held on to me. And a rugby player, I was like, a posh guy, you bash me into the thing. Cause I come out, smash me. I've got all claret down me. I go back to the, 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 the magistrates that I get. All three road. I'm back to there. I don't get bail. When I come back the following week, they've got all photos of me with all claret. They've said I've assaulted the police woman. He said, well, where's the fucking pictures of the assault? That's the first thing. He said, he's, he's about 13, 14 stones. She's fucking 10 stones. He said, how's he here? He said, as for the guy being knocked down, where's his bruises, right? He said, well, it ain't been produced yet. Anyway, he started arguing. He said, are you going to listen to my bail application? He went, has he been in trouble since he's been there? He said, no. He went, bailed but he'd give me on strict conditions at my mum's in the morning and my mum's in the afternoon. And I was made up, right? I said to Nobby, I said, can I go back to the cells? He went, fucking hell. He said, you're always trying to get out of the cells, right? He said, Nobby had seen the escape from before there, right? A year, three years earlier. I go back and I give 30 quid to a kid in the cell. I went, I'll see you later. Anyway, they don't produce the things in 12 weeks and they're supposed to drop it. And the magistrate said, what I'll do I'll give him one more week, but I'll drop your bail conditions. And I, I couldn't have committed a crime. And I'd have probably gone away for about eight months or a year. I don't know what it was. But one check, a second time around after being away, you'll get something, I think, right? Maybe four checks. It's four betting shops, maybe. So, because they bailed me, I'm now at it with the travellers' checks. I've got movement. I get nicked out in fucking Watford or somewhere. Oh, one other story. We go back to while I'm on the trot, right? I forgot this story. This is significant. I go abroad, get some money abroad, crime. I come back and I'm in the West End with Big Jim. And as we're walking, we see loads of videos. And we was off to steal a table from Fulton and Mason's. Where we'd get a grand each, right? I'm on a trot. And he says, we might, we might get a grand before we go. I said, go on then. He said, but it might be ready. I said, well, don't do it. He said, he said probably not. He said, but and he walked up to the thing, pushed the things. They're empty. He said, run. I run. Loads of causes come out. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an invitation to get someone to take these videos that you get about hundred quid a video, like video recorders then. Yeah. We'd have, we'd have got about, we'd have got about, he'd have got four, I'd have got four. We'd have got about three or 400 quid each. So I run, they knock one over. They get me, and they're about to batter me, <laughs> about to take uh, Western Central. They take me down a side bit, and they start shouting. They're going to do him, they're going to do him, they're going to do him anyway. So I go to the police station with Jimmy, 
I give a moody name. And they said, it should be assault. I hadn't assaulted no one, I just knocked him over. He said, but you're nicked for attempted theft. He said, I'm going to bail you. He said, you've been in trouble before. I said, never been in trouble. So I give a moody name that stands up with a, uh, uh, on the electoral list. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm going to, get bow before this and the cell door opens and Jimmy, who knows him, is a ticket tank in the West End, so they know him from all, all time, right? He said, Tom, Thomas Burr, my name was, right? He said, you're going to behave yourself? And I said, yeah. So as he bows me, is he going to turn up? And I said, yeah, of course I am. I didn't turn up, obviously, right? I'm fucking most wanted for all in fucking London sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Escapes, you know, this is before the, the, the escape thing, yeah? or during the escape thing. And the next day or three days later or whenever the prints come through, they turn up at... Uh, the court every day at the, um, sorry, the little miserable, my mate gets a cut of hundred quid a day and they nicked him every day. But as they come towards him, like he handed, he went, why the fuck are you nicking me? They went, we know who the other fella is. So I had that as well. So while I was wanted for all the fraud, mm -hmm. I got out the police station that way because the dabs only, only get processed the morning you go to court. There was no way of doing it in the police station and you had to go to the yard. So anyway, I'm now on the trot from Oh no, I, I break out of Kilburn Police Station, yeah? And two years before I'd gone to someone's house, I stayed overnight with some, some woman that I met. And when I come out at six in the morning, I, it was all like a flat park. So I go across and I think, oh, I'm at Kilburn. So the reason when I escape from Kilburn Police Station, I don't do a right, is because I know I'll get, I'll get seen for, for a distance. I couldn't get away. So I do a left, do a right, and I run into the train station. I get on the train at the front carriage, which I shouldn't have done, but it closed. And I heard, stop the, stop the, um, stop the train, stop the train. So I get the train door open. I run to the front across and the train driver must have seen me. But I run along, climb up a wall, jump down into a, a kind of place where there's a, a guy doing repairs. He went, you're frightened of life, hack me. I said, I'm sorry. He said, we, I said, I've just escaped. I said, can I have your over? He said, yeah. I said, can you cut me in? My hair was quite long, so I cut it short as possible. And um, I basically walk. Oh, you give me a couple of quid. I get a bus, ring someone, gets my mum, gets her mate. And Bill, who's, a, who, who's my first girlfriend's dad, he's a good street fighter. He's a lorry driver, a brilliant street fighter. He went, fucking hell. How many is that? I said, that's four in total now, right? So, three weeks later, I'm down South End. Four escapes? That's four escapes now. This is the escapes in total. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get out the police station at uh, Horsery Road. I get off the escort off the M1 when they catch me and take me, remember? I feel in the water. And I get out of the court. Then I've got out of uh, um, Kilburn. And this is after you get out of prison, after the first four strikes? After the four strikes, I get out of here. So then you're on the run for robberies? Yeah, one robbery. Right? Mm -hmm. I only got room one, but they got the reddies with the dabs on. Right? Mm -hmm. So it will come through. So what happens is, I'm on a phone and I said to someone, I said, this phone's hooked up. I said, the money was going like as fast as what it would on a mobile. There was no mobiles then. You didn't ring mobiles, so I yeah. did. It was going down. Like it, I needed to put money in. And I heard a siren in the distance. So. So the woman said to me, well, fucking put the phone down. I went, oh, so I put the phone down, I run to the beach and I hid. But I didn't look, I should have looked over. And, and what must have happened was they've come down. It was, must have been going around the block. I left it 15 minutes. So for some mad reason, I thought I was paranoid. I go back to the call box. And when I go back, I, 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 I I just knew it was a Cossack car. He's come up along. So I didn't go in the call box. He said, excuse me, sir. I said, yeah. He said, have you used that call box? I said, no. Nah. I wanted, but he wouldn't have a description. He, he, wouldn't, he might know he's coming to get me, but he wouldn't have a fucking photo. He just knew. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And I went, he went, I was, a bit, I was drunk, really drunk. He went, that's probably why the judgment was bad. And that's what I've learned. If you're not fit and you're not oh, no, having boy. early nights, if you make a judgment drunk in any way at your head, or even tired, it's always not the right judgment. If you make, if you're fit, you're going to bed early, I would say it's hard to stop you in anything. Anyway, I run. I run into a park and I, 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 I couldn't get out. 
they put lights on and I thought, if I climb up this tree, I can get over the fence. I had an idea. I missed my foot in and I fell from some distance high. I smashed down, crashed me, broke my arm, broke my leg. So Cosa said, you're lucky to be alive. I could have broke my back, but I fell on my, on my leg anyway. Go to the police station, I'm fucked. I can't hardly walk. Um, they said in the morning when they come and got me, they said, you've got to go to hospital. So I go to hospital, I've got a broken arm and leg. That's the end of it, isn't it? I'm, I'm on my way to one arm now, right? When they take me to the court, I'm in a wheelchair, legs up, arm, and they wasn't looking what I was doing. So I start going down towards where the lifts are, right? They wasn't looking. I wouldn't have got away. And I, was, I could see that the lift was on the upper floor and I was hoping it to come down. And all of a sudden, one of them said, come on, you've got to go. And he come and got me. He didn't realise that I was, I was going to try and go in the lift. I would have got, the lift would have come over and I'd just go in. So bring me in. I'm now going to Wandsworth. I arrive at Wandsworth. I'm in the hospital wing. So I'm playing chess. Yeah? So kid says to me, if you bang your head, they take you outside the court. They take you outside the hospital. I said, they won't. I said, I've escaped four times. He said, Russ, they've had loads of incidents. Anyone bangs their head now, they've got to do x-rays. He said, because people have died. So he gives me that night, two Valium. I'm on the, you're on the wing on your own. Bang the head, bang it properly. So there's a bump, all right, smash my head. I felt, a, I felt a kip. I woke up in the bed. They went, you're going outside the hospital. I said, okay. Take me to the hospital, and I'm in bed now, right? And I've got in the bed and all that. I don't even know if I can walk. <clears throat> so there's a screw there, and I heard him slagging me down to the nurse. Yeah, Jack, they would fucking escape her, fucking this, that, and the other. And he's, they're two-handed. And his mate went, do you want a sandwich? Do you want this? Do you want that? So his pal, he's gone. So there was a kid over there. He'd come and see me. He said, I heard you've escaped and all that. He said, we're on the 16th floor. He said, there's a police station two below. You've got no chance for me, so I can't fucking walk anyway. So he was either lighting a cigarette or buying some chocolate. And I see him go like that as I stood up. The geezer at the end of the bed, he must have been talking to like a girlfriend or something. He's got his head down like this. And I basically walked past him. You know, this is all on like crime programs and all that. So there's no, you know, like, you know, it was fucking big news at the time, right? So I just walked past him. And I must have covered my feet from the long blanket. I walk past him. As I go around the corner, the door just opened on the 16th floor. I go in the lift. One person got off. I'm on the ground floor. As I'm walking out, hobbling, the door, electronic door starts to thing. Now, what had happened was I'd, I'd met someone who'd escaped from a... It happens a lot in hospitals, right? And he hid in the building. They searched everywhere and they found him in the building. And I, I was going to hide in the building, but I thought, no, they'll find me. So I'm on the ground floor now and the door was electronically going to shut. Stopped it, it was easy to stop, but had it been locked, I wouldn't have been out of care. So I go, I said, excuse me, sir, I said, would you give me a lift? Some old boy said, nah, I see a big builder. I said, mate, listen to me. Yeah, I said, they're gonna nut me off. I said, I've got a kid, I've got a missus. I said, they're gonna give me fucking, I don't know what they're gonna give me. I said, please help me. I said, I, said, I don't wanna go to Broadmoor, please help me. He went, I've got to go to work. I said, I know you've got to go to work. I said, but I don't wanna, I said, I, I may never get out. He went, <laughs> he went, come on in, mate, right? <laughs> so, I said, can I have the boot? He gave me a pair of boots. I'm barefoot. Right? Give me a top and a builder's hat, right? And he drove me out. And now I start to hear the sirens. So I says, you've got any money? I've got no money. Give me a tenner. I said, mate, I never, I never, ever, ever forget you. So Bill picks me up. So he says, fucking hell, what are we doing? You're taking a piss now, right? I've got a broken arm and leg, right? I think I cut the thing off, by the way. Like the, 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 the plaster. he done it with a thing. I think I cut it off. Yeah, so it hurts as I'm walking, right? But prison hurts a lot more sort of thing, right? So I get to there and what I do, I go abroad, right? I had to wait for my arm to repair and my leg, but I go abroad. Otherwise it'd be all day. All different things happen, by the way, but I go abroad and I go to Paris. I've got a job in a restaurant. I ended up the chef. But what happened was the the inspectors for cleanliness come and they raided the gaff and I chipped out. They had my details, but there was an American chef in this restaurant near Notre Dame. And they said, he can't stay if it's a 20 grand fine. They said, who's, the, who's this geezer? He went, well, he was here, but he ran off. They went, okay, fair enough. They closed us down, me and this American guy who worked there, we painted it all, right? 
I'm sharing a flat a four-handed. One American guy and an Italian, she was lovely, she did all miming. And, a, and an actress from Slovenia who ended up quite famous, I believe. Anyway, when we do the place up, he's allowed to open, but they come again. And I go, I'm, I'm the chef in the gaff now. I learned how to cook and, and 20 things on the menu. And I bolt again. So they said, la engle, la rapida. They didn't like that I'd gone again. So, so I said, why did you go? I said, well, I said, I'm not going to stick around for, for people asking me questions. And I said, you don't want to get you in trouble. So I didn't fancy it. So I go to the south of France and I lived in a, I worked for this woman. But when I lived at her home, it was, it was doing my nose like really bad. Like I'm allergic to pollen and dust. Yeah, fever. I don't, but my dad gets it. But if it's high, I, 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 it catapults. So it has to be very high. But there was something in the air that I couldn't take it. So she had this farm there and she said, go there. So anyway, I used to work the land, get food off her. or well, 25 quid she used to give me. It wasn't much, but I was living simply. I was running seven miles. I said, well, I should do a circuit, go for walks for three hours. I was super fit, right? Super fit. I'd run seven, 10 kilometers, get my shopping, hitchhike back. As I tried back once, a woman gives me a lift and she said to me, oh, you're the Englishman living in a flat. Mate, uh, we're, 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 we're six kilometres away. I said, how did you know that? She said, oh, everyone knows. I thought, fuck it now, that's not good. I had to ring home a couple of times for money to be sent and it got there, but the kid I went through was Lawrence at the spill and I had to ring the spill and it would be a loaded phone. He goes to the call box. I think it come on from the spiel. Anyway, what's happened is I'm going down the shop one day and someone, someone stopped and said, ask me directions. And I thought, that's strange. You see one car maybe over there and back. I got to the thing, I see an helicopter. It flew really close. And I thought, can it be on me? So I buy some eggs, some food, and there's tennis courts at the end. And I walked, I didn't see anything. I thought, no, I'm all right. And as I come back, Someone asked me directions again. The chances of that is like fucking 1,000 at one shot, right? Or 10,000 at one, I thought, it's on me. So I go back, sit in this, this, this gaff, and I'm looking through the, 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 the uh, doorway, and I can see, a, they've got the helicopters have got a set of like, you know, like a, they can go for a mile through the, the thing. And I see the, the helicopter in the distance, and I was thinking, if it was a bit further over there, it couldn't see me. If it was a bit far over there, it couldn't see me. I thought, it's on me here, right? So, I thought, you can't run. I know from different experiences of running, you can't run at night across fields, you'll fall over and do your thing. So what I do, I, I, I wait until dusk, and I thought, if the helicopter sees me, I've got a like, moody lot, I'm going for a walk, and then run. So anyway, I run for about seven miles. I hitchhike, guy gives me a lift. And then it's pours of rain, but it was like a tropical rain. And a woman sees me, and I go like that. And they give you lifts out in France. So I talked to her around, I said, is there any chance I could stay at yours? She said, yeah, I'll ask my boyfriend. So I go back to hers, put me in a spare room, show him my passport. My passport's out of date. It's a one year passport out of date. They give me a tenner, give me some set of clothing. And she felt sorry for me. She didn't know my troubles, but she gave me a soft kiss in the morning. She said, uh, I forget what she said, but she said, please take care. Anyway, it's freezing all of a sudden. It's October time, so I needed somewhere to stay. So I go to the church and I say, would someone help me here, please? There were seven ladies, like Catholic women, all older. And the priest said, this man wants somewhere to stay. So one of them said, yeah. So I went back to this mansion. She was very rich and her husband, they gave me a room, made me food, let me stay there a couple of days. I rang my granddad, gets my mum, said, Mum, I've had an on top, send 80 quid and I'll buy a ticket. So I was going to go across to, to Spain, but I bottled it. You could walk across and they might stop 10 out of 100. And as I'm walking across, I, wouldn't, I was, didn't want to go back to, to England. As I walked across, I bottled it. I thought, I don't fancy it. I just couldn't do it. But why I'm going back to L London on an out of date passport is ridiculous. It's a bad judgment, but that was the judgment I made. So I get on the, what do I get on? I get on the, I get on the coach. And what I didn't fancy doing, so I'm thinking if it's on top there, they know my passport name. Do you see what I mean? If I'm right about the gaff, 
the, the, where I've, the, 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 the 20 miles away. Yeah. I'm thinking, so what I've done, I, I bribed him. I said, take the money. He took the money, but halfway through the journey, he come and got me, he said, there's more people getting on. You need to find a place and get a ticket quick. I just managed to get a ticket and I get back on the, tr on the, on the thing, but I don't fancy it. I'm worried if it, as you say, if this person has gone back to London, they put the name up. So I get to the airport, I get off first. I don't, I leave my stuff on the coach. That's what I did. I didn't, I didn't, um, when we get on the thing, we're supposed to now get back on the coach and go through customs, which are on our way to London. I didn't get back on the coach. I didn't fancy it. So I thought, I walk through and I see lorries. I thought, should I hitchhike? Try and get on the lorry and say to him, look, can I hide? I was thinking something like that. So I didn't. And I see some builders go through in front of me, walk through, and they didn't get stopped. So what I've done, I've got a paper, and there was a custom man just setting up, and I walked through, and I went like to him. I went, all right? And he went, all right? But he should have asked me for my ID, and he didn't. It's out of date. He probably says, why is it out of date? Or it's on the list. I walked through. So I'm back in London, but now it's war. And suddenly, we're not talking silly little fucking here behind the till, we're talking guards. I open the box, you can't, I've got a shotgun. I've got a gun, I've got this, you know, and it's like, it becomes, over a two year period, it, it escalates and it's heavy. Crime programs, fucking papers, this geese, that thing, blah, blah, blah. It es it's just gone out of proportion. I'm suddenly, probably me and Noy, the most wanted in the country, right? But they're sitting there, kill ya. It's strong in it. It's gone like it's ridiculous. And Peter Scott, the, the cat burglar that I was, he was helping me. He said, "Listen, if you can get a painting, a high value painting, I can get seven and a half percent." So I said, "Let's go down." So uh, uh, where did I say Mayfair? And what happened? He stops to have a piss in a thing. I said, "Well, be lively, Peter, because I'm on a trot." <clears throat> <clears throat> it comes up. And when I was a kid, my mum had a print of a Picasso print. So the only artist I knew a little bit about was Picasso, because I knew he was like a famous thing. It wasn't worth any money. <clears throat> but I'd seen Picasso books. And as I walked past this first guy, I said, that's, that's Picasso. I said, that's it. We'll have that. But when I go to see the geezer, I don't fancy it. I said, well, I might do it, might not. I don't tell him it's a Picasso. And I left it. I've got money. Oh, that's right. When I go back, I'm denied. When I go back, it wasn't in the front window. Right? It'd gone. I said, it must have been sold, Peter. So we'll leave that. And I was going to leave it. So I said, we'll have to find another painting. So one day I'm in the West End for, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And as I walk past the gallery, <sighs> it sealed my fate. <laughs> I see the Picasso on the inside, what? Inside the gallery. It was inside, but not in the front spot. So George Chatham was the, greatest cat burglar arguably ever. I was staying around his before I had the flat that I was at. And we go and see him, he said, what do you think? He said, if to get out of Mayfair, they can close it off quick. So you need to get out. So what I do, I say, I'm gonna get a taxi. So on the morning of the Picasso robbery, I, I get a taxi into town. I, got, I had to get extra large doors because the frame was like the size of a 50 inch uh, television screen. Anyway. Get, I get the taxi, go to an alleyway, park it, I go in the thing, right? The CCTV wasn't, I had a pro hat, glasses, and my, my hair was in like in a ponytail. You could, but it was up, so you wouldn't know it was in a ponytail, it looked short. But what happened was, as I went, it, it bounced out. And they called me the ponytail robber. And my dad had seen me with a ponytail, right? So what happens, I go in and say, how much to Picasso? She went, a million dollars. I said, I've got a shotgun, take it off the wall. She went, you want it, you take it off the wall yourself. So she said to me, posh bird. <laughs> but she went, you, yeah, 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 so I did. So there's a blonde behind me, younger woman. She sees it go and she, she, she and the woman said, I got out. When I get the depths later, she says to the woman, don't, he's got a shotgun. But what she does, she comes out of the chase. So as I'm, trotting across the, 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 the thing. I put the Picasso in the thing. I look round the woman and a security guard. So I point the shotgun at them, they fuck off. The, the taxi driver said, what's going on? I, says, I said, it's a fucking robbery, that's what's going on. I said, I'm sorry, pal, you're gonna take me across London. 
two geezers come to the thing, fuck off. We get to the bottom, I miscalculated the traffic going into Piccadilly. I said, no, you've got to go across. It was like a, he had to mount a, a pavement that was very high, done brilliant. He's mounting the pavement, we've gone, and we're now across London. So I'd seen something on TV where I knew they had an emergency thing. They could- Red button kind of thing. He's a, he's a, he's a computer cab. So I know they've got a satellite thing where they can track it. So while I was with him, I stopped. I needed to make a call. I know it sounds mad, but I stopped. I get out of Texas, I said, don't try anything silly. He said, you've got a shotgun, how could I try anything silly? I said, mate, you'd be surprised what people do. Do not try anything silly. So we go in, I said, stand over there, please, right? Go in the gap, right? Anyway, I come back out, we're now going back in the taxi. So from a distance, I saw a, 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 a helicopter coming sort of my way. I said, see that thing? I said, undo it. I said, I want it, I want it disconnected. And he went, look, I'll do it. Disconnected. They was, they was tracking it. I found out later when I'm nicked, they was tracking it. So they would have got me, right? But I just remember something I'd seen on TV. So what I would say is, from a kid and all the stories, I, I used to talk to all the robbers when I was at Wandsworth. I knew a lot of information about people on the run, robbers, and I had... I had knowledge, it was the knowledge that I had that made it hard for me to, to get caught while I'm, and basically the rule is this. Once you end up on TV and all that, if you're going in a pub every day, the woman will recognize you. If you go in a betting shop, if you go in a restaurant, if you go anywhere, shop. So what I always did, I wouldn't go any, any one place twice in a week. You forget my face. And that was my method. And that was why they never got a call to get me for two years. I'm going to tell you, I was fit. I was more or less unstoppable, right? They had a 50 grand reward from the clearing banks and a 50 grand reward for the Picasso for me, right? So it's 100 large. So I'm gone if someone fancies that, right? And what happens, we, when I, when I, Drop the taxi driver off, I give him 30 quid. I said, listen, mate, I said, I'm sorry about that. And he was relieved. He was, I could see he was relieved. I felt bad, you know what I mean? Because it wasn't intentional. But along the way, I said to him, listen, pal, yeah? I can't do a fucking 15 for you. So I'm sorry, but you've got to take me across London. I was trying to make him laugh with little jokes. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get myself a bottle of champagne now and look at the painting. He didn't know it was a robber. He might have thought it was a, an eccentric. And the mob hunting for it originally didn't know it was me but the flying squad knew because of the thing. And my dad had said to me before this, why don't you think about giving yourself in? They can't fucking get you. He said, you might fucking only do a five or six. I said, dad, I only might do an eight anyway. I said, so why give myself in? I said, no point. He said, he said, why am I fucking escalates? He said, you you know, he said, you'll get shot dead. He said, what well, do you think? They're gonna give you a chance to run off again, which is right. So I'm now in Leeds. I've got a flat, I'm out clubbing, and it's all madness. But when I get this flat, I've paid six months in advance, and the guy next door doesn't know that the flat has been rented. So I come back from a club and I'm drunk, right? I'm not a big drinker, but if I go to a club, I'll drink, over drink. Not in a pub, I'll have two pints. I'm like that. I couldn't remember the code. He called the police, so this cosa comes down, and he says, um, I tried to run. So I was stupid, I had a shotgun in the thing, red is like 20, 30 grand or something, under the bed. I run, they nick me. He says, you nicked for assault. When I get to the station, I remember, I had to, oh, when I get to the station, I fall, fall out the, the, the carriage. I just fell, I smashed my head, and I got all clouds down me. And the sergeant went, I said, Sarge, I said, look, I've got my, my idea. I said, I didn't assault him. But because I've got the injury, they want to cover themselves. So I give him the thing. I remembered I had the idea in me. If I'd have said to the cosa, there's my idea, you'd let me in my flat. So anyway, I'm now on the way to the hospital. I come back to the station. I think that's the end of it, right? Go to sleep about nine in the morning. Door opens. So we're going to bail you. You've got to go back to the police station in a week. What you've got to understand is when they take your dabs, they cannot process. If, if you, back then, not now. Yeah, it's all computerised now. Yeah, but back then they had to go to where the computer was. It wasn't in every police station. So they couldn't test your dabs. If you got bail, they only made sure that who they knew you was by the time you went to court. 
That's how it worked. So when he said to me, you're going to be bowed, I know there'd be photographs of me in the fucking gaff. You know what I mean? There'd be photographs from every police station in fucking England, right? So he, he bows me, right? And I go. But I said, I want to know, I want to, so I stronged it now, right? This is, these are the sort of things you shouldn't do. But he said, right, I said, what is, the, what is the name of your superior? What's the address? He wrote it all down, right? This is strong in it. I should really just be walking out the fucking door. I said, what's the name of the policeman? Who, uh, who said I saw with him, right? So when I get to the post office, the first thing I've done, right, I'm, I've got to go and get my fucking shotgun and my readies and I'm off. I write a letter. I say, I'd just like to thank you, Superintendent Fingerbob, for, for all your excellence day and your thing, right? The policeman who, who said I saw with him, I can assure you I didn't. I said, but if it wasn't for him, right, allowing me to fall out the thing and bang my head, I said, maybe you wouldn't have uh, given me a bow. Right? So anyway, I sent that in, right? So I know they're going to fucking hate it when they know it's me. So anyway, I go, and I go to Southampton now. I go other places, but I end up in Southampton. And what happens is, they find me. Why? You can never work that out, but what it is, if you, if you go somewhere once, don't go back there. It, it, on the run is a dead end road, but you've always got the first move. You, you can't, you can beat them if you're prepared to go abroad for a long time or never go anywhere twice and have a bit of help. But I wouldn't go abroad. It's, it's really difficult abroad. And you miss London and you miss people and you always need a bit of help. Yeah, you need readies. And you can't get money abroad. No, you wouldn't do anything in Paris. They'd kill you out there. Holland, I could have gone. They'd kill you out there. You get ready. You won't get much jail, but it's heavy. So you just go straight. But it's not easy going straight. You've got tax. You've got, it's even diff, more difficult now. See, were you watching the cowboy films and your father, who he was, and the films that's been out about him, the reputation he had? Did you feel like a sense of power going through that as if you were living your own sort of movie? On the money, yeah. What it, yeah, what it is, it, it, it's an ego thing. The best, the best moment was when I come when I had the broken arm and leg. That was my. It was never the Picasso. It was getting out with a broken arm and leg. That was my highest moment in crime. Because I was never about the reddits. I was, as someone says, around the angel, some girlfriend, like a friend of mine, she's a girlfriend. She said, you always like the bravado. And I did. I loved nothing better. I always, there was someone really wanted in London. And I used to love saying to my mum, he's still on a trot. And there was a geezer out in Australia. I had mates from Australia. They'd say, he's still on I say, is he still on a trot? He lasted seven years. They got him. And what I noticed was everyone gets caught and it hurt me that everyone gets caught and I just wanted to be the one person who never got caught. So, when it come for me, I woke up in the morning and I didn't fancy it. I, I, I felt not good. I go into cities, I go into the city centre and um, all of a sudden I see a car whizzing past. I thought, I'm reading something, it's an article on me, right? I go like that I thought, was that the fucking flying squad? And as I went like that, I'd had a late night with, with someone, right? She'd had me up three nights and it was late and I didn't think quick enough. It, it made a difference. I should have bolted. As I look, I look there, I'm police, move, I blow your head off. Like, right? And I thought, you can't run. And they come behind, they went, get on the floor, get on the floor, I won't get on the floor, right? So they smashed me on the floor, I'd done my knee. So think about me. They, they got this silly hat. It's just, that's why they call it the pavement. When they nick you, they nick you on the pavement, right? So because I said something, I said, I'm in a fucking hotel. And he looked at me, much as I say, come on, Ross, you know we've bottled you off. Because that's what they do. They don't just come on the first night. They have a little look for you. And I remember the van down the road. I remember other things. And it, I, I remember a case, and I thought, is that a fucking ca Could that be a surveillance camera? I didn't go. I had the chance. I didn't go, but I wasn't sharp enough. So... I got a 15 stretch. And what broke me heart, when they took me to court one day, this is how lucky I am, I could have escaped again. <laughs> this is what happened. I go into the, the court, it's halfway through, but I'm, while I'm away, I meet Paul Ferris, right? So me and Ferris used to have wars, badminton and chess. He's a practical joker. Yeah, black, black humor, he's funny and bastard, man. I, I love the death, and one of them, yeah, same. one of them, he, he, he it's just all different things. Like, I can't tell you how funny it is, but I'll, I'll skip forward, yeah? So me and him as good pals. 
and uh, we, we had a badminton war. And on this last day, it was boiling hot. And afterwards, I couldn't move my arm up. He looked like a boxer who was going to fall over, right? He was sweating. I'd, I'd do him, right? So I'd make sure you, if when you see him, say it's in Russell's head, you know, <laughs> right? And the chess, once I got to 15, he, he didn't stop beating me. He said, hey, he said, I think we're about level on games now, Russ. I said, yeah, only because of fucking my head's gone, getting the 15 thing. But anyway, he, he helped me with everything, and it was about even shot. So what's happened? A van before me has hit the, the shutter that goes down. Yeah, it's hit it, it won't go down. So we go further in, and they've got to open the door, and then you put your hand through a little slit. I'm, I'm four-time escapee. Or was it five times then? Five. I've escaped five times, right? I know I haven't actually got away, but getting out of the court made, was an escape, because it was outside the court. And I'm supposed to put, I went to go like that, the door opened. And all I wanted to do was jump down. I never took it. There was one coser at the front up there. I could have jumped off the van and run up. And I never took it. And when I went to court, one person found me not guilty. I had no chance of beating it. One person found me not guilty. She was crying. And I went, don't worry about it. And the rest of them found me guilty. He went, when he summed up, he said, listen. He said, you do things, he, what he mostly said was, you do things in a basic way. And it looks common and, and, and vulgar and this, that and that. He said, but you've done it with some panache. He said, you're going away for 15 years. So that was it. What you, what's going through your mind when you get the 15 stretch? Two of the cousins come over and said, we thought you were going to do us. Third one went, I knew you was fucked. He said, there's no way you was getting out of this, right? But two of them said, we thought you'd done us. Because that was why I, I hesitated. But if you want to be Jesse James or Jacques Mazarin, Jacques Marine, you have to call him because he don't like that. If you want to be Dillinger, that's what Peter Scott used to say to me, they do you. Like Dillinger, he said, you'll get the Dillinger bullet. I said, yeah, but I ain't shot no one, Peter. I said, so why would it? He said, but well, after what you've done. And that's what my dad was worried about. He was saying, why don't you call it a day, you're in front, and start your life again. But I watched too many Jesse James films. I watched Dillinger, I watched The Great Escape. I, I, oh, and the only time I... I, I Dillinger, he was... Jack, John Dillinger in, in John, the USA. Yeah, I watched the film with Johnny, Johnny Depp. Depp. They do him from behind. And, I've got to be honest with you, when them things used to happen, I used to feel a chill. And I watched Mezzarine in, I was, I was in Birmingham. And he, at the end, it's a brilliant film, he's dripping in blood. And I sat there and I was a little bit phased. I remember thinking, because I, oh, I haven't told you what, what, what the, what the, what the um, yeah, sorry. I'm sitting there thinking, am I going to end up like him? The dripping in the blood, dead. So, there was moments when I'm very, very confident, but occasionally, like Dillinger film and all that, I'd think about it. They all get killed, them people. And I aspire to them people, but I'm not as dangerous as them people. You, you can't say there ain't no one out there who said you've been shot or whatever. You know, even the Cosa, when he got the four stitches, they try to say assault. I said, I run a trial, and they dropped it out. Because I never fucking hit him. Did you go through a psychiatric reports or anything? No, nah, nothing like that. Well, you, you've got to be mad to fucking want to stay in jail. Why would you? There's no nothing psychiatric about <laughs> about <laughs> trying to get out. Trying to get out. You've got to be mad not mm. to. But so when you get the 15 stretched. I did have psychiatric reports for for court, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the judge said if you pursue it, if he says you're mad, I knew he said I wouldn't say. It. He says you said you're going to Broadmoor. I said he ain't gonna sound mad, something like that, you know. So I did have them, but not at the prison. It was private sort of thing. So see when you get your 15 st stretch. Did you have any chance to escape while Only the, just the one at the start of court? Yeah, but what, 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 what it was, when I got guilty, I had one more plan. When they let you off at the bottom of the hill, they're waiting for the next van. So it's the same trick with the, the thing. And, but they walk you through, and then they cuff you off, and you walk through. And it takes a while before you hear any movement behind. So what I was going to do, but he'd done it differently, walked me right through to the cells. I was going to say, I don't feel well. I was going to, uh, Jimmy had this trick when the police used to try and batter me, say, <gasps> I'm asthmatic, right? So I was going to do something like that. Dwell the box, sit there like that, off the cuffs, and just run random and hope that as I run back to where the coaches are, the, the next coach is coming in. Do you see what I mean? It's about a one in 10 chance. So that is, and, but they never done it. When I got weighed off, it took me right away to the cells, which is what they should do. But they don't always do it, you see. It's, it's the breaking of procedure 
where you, you argue to get your chance, but I never got another chance after that. But I don't finish off. I go, I go on one robbery and I shouldn't have done it. Scouts firm said we might get 300 large or something like that. And this is after your 15 stretch? Yeah, I ain't finished it off. I'm, I've got, still, I've got, I didn't go back on a, on a, on a, on a town, vi on a home visit, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you're doing your 15 stretch. I could have got the reddish and gone back or whatever. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've only got like four months to do or something, right? Yeah. But it's not so in lack of intelligence because you're not on license. When, with someone like me, you're on license for, I've got six, I've got a uh, 15, you're on license for, like seven years. So if you get in an argument, you will recall back to the prison. But if you haven't finished your sentence, you're on the trot, but you can't get nicked for nothing. You can't get recalled for, you know, you just go back and finish your sentence. So it's worth it. But anyway, it went wrong on the robbery. And what happened was, I don't normally work with firms. I just got smashed in the kite with a meat clear, <laughs> right? The kid, it didn't work out. And, um, he missed the door, so we couldn't get to where the cash machines were. So there's a, there's a, there's a box coming out, there's probably no money in it, or three grand. It's, and what should we do? I should take the fucking box, right? So he goes, I run the wrong way, I forgot where the car was. I mean, I'd only been out days, right? I run back to the car, the geezer's decided to be a hero. I've pulled him away, he's got a trolley. I mean, I don't understand why people do it. You know, the other kid's got to meet people, I punched him, I got him on the floor get in the car and we drive off. You can't even get the box open, the kid I'm with, like they've got a way of knocking it from the boot of the car and it opens. There's different ways of doing it. I don't do that. I always make them open the box, open the box. I don't do that. that take, I don't take the fucking box. None of that. It's open the box, pal. So, I'm all claret. At the scene of the crime, I didn't know this. At the scene of the crime, there was no blood, but you would have thought there was. In the car, there was no blood, but where we left the car, there was all blood. And it was that that done me. DNA? Uh, yeah, done me. So I knew I was gone. So I'm thinking it's, an in, in, it's arguably an indeterminate sentence. I might get, might get a five for that. I've got a six. I, I might get a five for it. And at the time, I thought you did the five for the five. When I, when I get nicked, I think I'm looking, when it, when I, they give me a 16. When I got the 16, I thought I'm doing six. If it had, if it had been an indeterminate, I would have got 16 years. I thought you'd do the whole lot, but it's half. Anyway, so I go back, I'm fucked. They stitch my thing up for me. I've got a scar there. And I live with people and all that, good people in Liverpool. Like, I can't tell you how lovely. Like, yeah, I love the Scousers. People looking after me. And my mate, John, John, I've got to say his name, John Byrne. He's like heroic, you know, and family and all different people looking after me. They kick off the door there, two little kids, I know, like six and eight at the time, like that. Like if they ob if they observed the gaff for a week, I'm not there. But they heard I was there. They took they took a few liberties, shall I say? Run me out of town. Anyway, like posters and shit. So I go to we're now getting towards the end of the story, thank God. So I get to to uh, Blackpool, and I have a bit of work. What happens? I cut my fucking hand. I mean, like, I couldn't believe it. Claret. I get on a bike. And I, leave, I dump the bike, but they find the bike. It's all my claret. So I'm sitting in a hotel, I've got a bottle of champagne. I'm looking at the TV all of a sudden. Russell, uh, Russell, uh, John McVicker, son, Russell Grant McVicker, wanted for a bit of work. Like, well, it's like 25, it's either 25 or 20. I can't even fucking remember. Wanted in Blackpool, and I'm thinking, here we go again. Right, so now I've got two bits of work. So I'm thinking, they was just starting to phase the, the, the indeterminate sentence now. So, all those years, I was thinking on my head, why did you not run? So, now the Mezzarine film's out. We're now in 2009. The Picasso happens in 1997, okay? So, we've gone, I start out escaping in 86, and now it's 2009. So, all the ag I've just talked, I've had, and more. I mean, you couldn't get it in, all the ag I've had. But the people who supported me throughout and helped me all my life, I... I, I I thank God for them people because they, some of them didn't know me and they, they helped me and they risked their liberty for me and they did things for me like Mary, Tricky, uh, John, Barbara, one of them, Phil and all these people and other, and they're, 
other people. So you end up in crime with 200 of you and 200 causes known about you. The fact that you're in national press, it don't mean nothing because you look at a paper, it's just yesterday's news. So when you're wanted, there's only four or 500 people who know about you realistically and who care. And out of them, there's only 10 or 20 who really care. And at the police, they've got other things to do. But the ones who are hunting you, the key eight, they're the dangerous ones. So because of the Mezzarine film and the Dillinger thing, I'm, I always thought, because I'm going to run. When they come on me ne next time, I'm going to run. Because it hounded me for years. I mean, I can remember all the other things as a kid. I'm the sort of person, if I missed a penalty, I wouldn't forget it. But you've got to be positive. So when I see the Mezzarine film and Dillinger, which come out in 2008, 2009, it was 2009, I thought, could I end up like that? So I had an eerie feeling, because I'm going to run. When they come on me this time, I'm going to run. Anyway. I have a bad feeling at four o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. I think, go. It's never happened to me before. And I didn't. Then I had a bad dream. I go out in the morning, I'm on my bike. And I see a bird. She was. She had a barber on. And it was like a, in the Terminator film. When the Terminator sees the thing, it goes like that sort of thing. And she went, she must be trained to, to, to make sure it's you. She sort of went like that. And as I drifted that way, she drifted that way. And there was a cause of there, but he was beyond, beyond the thing. It was her who was the danger. She went like that. I skipped around, get off. And I've got a little trick from where I am. I always have a little hat. And I walk off. I get a taxi. I go round. This is a mistake. I go round. There's no police there, so I thought, are you paranoid? I wasn't certain. I was meeting someone. I said, listen to me, don't come down. I said, because it's on top here. She went, I'm already down. Anyway, I go back to the gaff, right? If you'd have said to that fraud mob, they was ex, on that fraud mob, they was the best squad that hunted me. They had ex flying squad and ex murder squad. They was, in my opinion, what I learned afterwards, they was cleverer but they was unlucky. I was lucky during that period because I was just lucky, but I was also very observant. Like not many people would bother going in one house and out the back. You wouldn't bother doing that most people, but I would, right? So I'm thinking if the day ever comes, I will run. So on the day, on this night, I've bumped into Big Jim, my mate. This, this is how lucky I am. I ain't seen him in 25 years. He said, fuck, he can't believe I've had two bad wanteds. A 30 grand reward. It wasn't 50 or nothing, but it was 30 grand on Crime Watch. And they put me two weeks on the spin. You'll never see that. What they knew was, on the first week, if you stay where you are, once you, it goes into the second week, you just go out and act normal. They put me on the second week and it did throw me. I thought, fuck me, I could have made a rick here, but I never go to the same place twice. And I never talk to neighbours. I go. In, I won't stay in the gaff I'm talking to neighbours because you can't, read every paper, internet and all the rest of it. So they'd done it twice on the spin. He went, they've got a lot of calls. They was trying to spook me, so I moved. Anyway, months later, whatever. I'm in London and they get me. So Jimmy's bird said to me, right, his missus, she said, why don't you stay the night? I said, no, I'm going home. I was with someone. She was going back to the gaff. She goes back to the gaff early and I forgot my phone. I was supposed to ring her and say, is there any old building? When she got there, she knew. When they got there, they swept her. So now I'm going there about half hour later. I said, see you later. I, I, I didn't have the phone. I've gone back. I thought I'm paranoid. So I go back. I thought the two people I see, maybe they was not robbery squad, but they was. So I go back. As I go back, the light's off and I, I left the light on special. I thought I see someone's head move back. All of a sudden, I'm please don't move. So it's day of judgment time, do I run? Don't I fucking run? But if you think about it for a 10 stretch, I've got to run. And he went to me, is this something I laid down on the floor or something, right? He said, he said something. I oh, know I had my hands in my pockets. He went, take your hands out. You shouldn't have your hands in your pockets. They'll kill you. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have my hands. He said, take your hands out of your pockets. Take your hands out of your pockets. I went like that. He went, turn around and face the wall or something. And I just went, I thought, well, you've got to go for it. And I went for it. So I've rolled, I, I, I bolt. He don't shoot me. He's running after me. But what he'd done, his training, he had to put the gun and use the taser. And I had these boots on that I'd bought that week. These, like, from wherever, from damn Chelsea, where I had to put these boots on. I always got trainers on. And I nearly put my trainers on that night. I fall because of the trainers. 
because he said, it, I've got a taser on you and I can see the red light, I can't carry him running straight, but I should have done, he would have missed me, I didn't know this. So I do a left, there's a, it's going like that, and I'm thinking they'd be all running around the corner, so I never run back. I, I run that way. He got me by an inch there. It only just got me. So he would have missed me running, but I didn't know that. So if, you, if you've got someone running after with a taser, just carry on running because they're missed. So he tases me. I scream like when you're free and you look, drop your ice cream. So he's come over, took the finger. He went, right. He took the finger. He's going through his procedure. Is he mad? I just thought, are you mad? I've got, got my, I'm drunk, but I've got my finger back. He went, lay down on the floor and went towards him. In the depths, he says, he tried to grab his gun. I didn't, right? I tried to hit him, but I wasn't sharp enough. I wasn't, I just wasn't sharp enough or brave enough or something. I wasn't determined enough. That's the word. It's not really, it's, it's being sharp. You know, you can't hit a sharp man. You, you know, I could have got him. And, he, he, and this time he's done me again. He's done me in, right dead center. <clears throat> but this time he's bashed me. So he's got me on the floor, but I won't let him cuff me. So we're scuffling. There's no, no one coming from the flat. We're about 200 meters away. And he had uh, like a static taser. He'd done me five times. Oh no, he stood up and he shot me. But he, he, this is why I know he wouldn't have got me. He's, got, he's aiming me from the back. He's got me there. The third one hit me there, right? I couldn't move. It freezes you, but it doesn't knock you over, right? He's pulled it out and he's done me like that. He's done me another five times. And on the fifth one, I went, and I can't, I said to him, I give in. I couldn't help it. I'd had about, I'd had five and three. I couldn't take no more. I'm right? central nervous system and then enough. But I've been fit, I might have been able to take another two, but I wouldn't have got away. They cuffed me, they come, they stood me up. And it's like a, the end of the war, isn't it? They never read me my rights. I not a fucking thing. And I could see he was shaking up. And they all stood, <laughs> and he went silent. And I thought, you're going to get an IPP, you're fucked here, right? <laughs> and he went silent and they didn't hold me. And we just walked down very gracefully. And when I got to the van, they held me and I looked down to see this pub. I thought, am I going to ever see the street again? So I ended up in court. And of course, I've got one more escape story, but I don't get away. I'm sitting with my brief, who's a Mancunian. She's been sent, for, so they couldn't get up from London. And I see someone come in here. They let some people in. And I thought, I've got a chance here. So I just carried on talking, talking, talking. And when I knew he'd gone down to, to, to collect some people, right? I said, I'm off now. I see you later. She couldn't didn't know why I was cut the things there. He said, the fellow went, do you want a cup of tea? I, he got the tea. Give me the tea. As I went back to the cell, I thought, right, I've got, I've, I'm only guessing. I walk back. I go, boom, right in his thing. I didn't do him in the boat race. Because you I didn't, you couldn't get lifed off for it. For hot, scalding water. Very dangerous stuff for in someone's boat race. So I'm pleased I didn't. And plus I didn't think he deserved it. You know, he was a little guy. You know, that was enough. But it wasn't enough because I'd done him, this big lump here, shit here. And a guy, the screw, just about to lock here, you know, he's ain't got time. He ain't, he's jumbling. I go to the thing, he goes to the other side and they were like this. Right, so I'm about 14 stone fit. No, for 13 and a half I'm fit. I'm probably about 13 and a half. So I'm going, and they, the, the, the woman, and a guy that I'd done scolding, they, they just took a little bit of strength from me because he, he wasn't big enough, this guy. It's like you and me, you look about 15, 16 stone, something like that. In the push thing, you should get the better of me, but he was lighter than me. So it was going like that, like that. And on the third go, I, I couldn't do it. The big lump come, done me. I'm like that. He, he locked it from the other side, the screw. I'm like, I'm like that. And they went, are you going to behave yourself? I said, well, wow. I said, well, how am I going to escape? Right, he had my arm. I said, um, I said, it's either that will carry me to the cell. He let me go. I went back to the cell. And as that was my last, but it wasn't my last, it, it was my last attempt. It was my last attempt. So I never got another chance. So I go to, who do I meet? I end up in, I go to Liverpool jail. I've got loads of stories there, but it'll be on day. And I end up in a maximum security jail with Curtis Warren. So he's just arrived at the jail, right? Do you want to hear this story? Yeah. It's a good story. So Ferris will tell you when you see him. So if you had a bad, bad, if I couldn't fire, it's, I had physio on this arm, right? I should call him the Flying Scotsman. That's what I used to call him, right? 
But I didn't write to him from my, one of those years ago because he was a high profile guy. And I come off, I was on the ACAT, I come off after a year. But I wouldn't speak to him who was ACAT. What was your sentence? When I got the 15. On the next one, oh, sorry, I get the 16. So it was a 16 you got? Yeah, so I go to Liverpool before I tell you about Curtis, right? I go to Liverpool and there's a geezer comes out of the shower thing, we're, we're, all, we're all dressed. And he, I said, you look happy, mate, right? I mean, I'm fucking gutted. He went, yeah, so I was expecting a seven IPP. He said, I've got a five, judge, judge whatever. I said, what are you? He said, robber. I said, I'm a robber. He said, you should be all right. I told him, he went, no, you're not going to be all right, mate. <laughs> right? He couldn't believe it. He went, no, you're not going to be all right. I only told him about two robbers, but I think he knew who I was. And he went, he went, no, you're in trouble. He said, I'm going to tell you three judges to avoid. One was Swift, one was the Ed Geezer they was all terrified of, and one was someone else. So when I went through the proceedings, you go up every month. The first one, my brother said, he might. I said, no, 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 Swift, drop him out. The second one was the next one who gives an indeterminate. The third one is the next one. So had I not known and gone guilty, I would have got probably, an in, I would have got probably six years to do. But if you look back on all my prison, I don't work in workshops, I won't do this. I don't behave myself enough to get out on a sentence like that. They would hold on to me for about eight years. So when I go, do go up, Judge Mad Judge James, he said, I don't give indeterminate sentences. So I went guilty. Anyway, I'm now at maximum security. Curtis Warren arrives and he's, a, he's supposed to be the best tennis player in the system. So someone's a little kid, Shaddy, not a little kid, he's a gang member from, from, from Manchester. He says, you can play thing. Russ, I said, yeah, he's a mad gambler, Shaddy, right? And so, so, you know, I am as well. We both gamble on everything, on, on football and, and other things. He said, well, he thinks he's the best. I said, well, is me or Keith Stewart are the best? A fat Northerner who I never beat from Manchester, who I love dearly, right? But I said, I'll have half ounce on it. So by the time we get back, there's probably hundreds of pounds of burn and more going on this thing. So I'm going to the gym the day before we're having the big match, me and Curtis. He says, you want, you want, you want a game, lad? I said, I'm going for a run. He said, what difference? I said, he said, we're going to play tomorrow. Why don't we just, it was a mistake on it. It was a mistake for him, right? <laughs> we go and play. It was the biggest mistake he ever made in his, in his tennis career. We go down the um, gym, 6-2 to him. He's got the best forehand, he's left-handed, and he, he, he's got the best forehand I've ever played against. But his backhand is no better, he's not better than mine, his backhand. So he kills me. So I come back to the wing, I said, right, I'll settle half my debt. I said, I've got no chance for this geezer, it's mustard. I said, Curtis, well done, mate, right? And he says, sorry, Dad. I said, no, you're different class, fair play to you. So I sat there that night, no one, no one wanted to give mercy. You're looking for a bit of mercy, no mercy at all, right? So all of a sudden, he's, he, no one would, oh, so I'm, I'm up for none. So I thought, what can I do that's different? I'll just put everything on his backhand. So we go in, there's Bronson, a geezer called, uh, uh, a friend of Curtis's, who's called uh, Magoo, and another geezer referee in it, right? Big Stan, great boxer in the day from Garston, I think, right? And he would, he would have beat me at tennis if he was the same age, great tennis player, but he's a bit old in there, right? So they're refereeing it, me and him, right? This proper fucking needle, I'm four nil up. Right? Every single shot, I'm not trying to win the shot over there, I'm putting it to his backhand. He's struggling a bit, and then I'll smash it over there. I'm 4 0 up, and I'm thinking I've done the, you know, the legend sort of thing, right? But it's a bit of banter, because I'm not as fit as him, so I play for time. I go like that, and I kick the ball away as I go, get his fucking hell, lads, fucking all that bollocks, you know what I mean? Right? I'm playing for time. I said, well, you can't be Superman from Liverpool like you, right? He's super fit. He can do rowing in under about 17 and a half minutes and he's not tall, right? You know, I can do 20, but, you know, I'm not practicing it. I can do a 20 without practicing, right? So I'll probably get down to 19, but I won't get that. He does circuits, press-ups and fucking mad things, right? So he's super fit, but he's struggling all of a sudden. It's 4-1, then it's 4-2, then it's 4-3, then it's 4 all right? I thought, fuck it, you know, this geezer, right? And he can see he's looking at me, right? We're changing every two games, right? I'm looking at the three, right? There's loads of people bet against him, not because they think I'll win, but because they want to take him on. They'd love to crack with him, you know what I mean? A banker and all that, right? So it's the two-way split. It's like about a grand either way. They're all different people. It's a massive thing in the jail. Everyone's fucking, so, you know, bet on it. He went, I went 5-4. I, I was always one in front. And all of a sudden, I thought, no, nah, I've got him here. I've done him. Right? 
I've done it. And uh, then they called time. It was in the next set, it was two all. But whoever's winning has won. And he went, he says something like, fair play to you, lad. <laughs> you, know, you tricky cockney or something like that, right? And from that, we become very good friends. But I was always taking on my badminton, and badminton is a different cat of fish. I mean, I played tennis since I was 10. So did he, Curtis. But badminton, no. I always tried, and I got a draw with him once. And had it gone a little half hour late, or 10 minutes later, he'd have won. But he always said, no, you've got a draw. So when we used to walk back, it's a quarter of a mile walk. So when we come back from Badman, right, he would always give me the, the, the jabber. He thought, you come down here, lad, gonna do this, gonna do that. And he, it was funny with the banter. So we had years of banter between us. Then he gets swagged, then he comes back. My eight years is up, and this is the last story. I used to play a guy called Colin Joyce, very good chess player. Beat him once to 10. He's the Gooch gang, alleged leader, right? And I knew Cabo used to play football with his co-D. So I had like a little fucking dot there, right? I've only got eight months left. I had a dot there and I thought, I wouldn't like it if, you know, it's a little bit, I was a bit vain about it. I thought, you know, if you have uh, like a girlfriend or something, it's, it, it was horrible. It was like a thing, this thing. I didn't think nothing of it. So my, I got wax in me ear. So I go down to the thing. I said, I've been putting olive oil in it. Could you do the, the ear, please? Susie, her name was. She said, I'm not supposed to do it. I said, well, I said, like, yeah, come out straight away. Come out straight away, but she caught the nerve. Anyway, next day, I'm playing chess and it's starting to swell up. And John Iannacci was my pal and he smashed the whole fucking wing up. And then only went on for him for a hundred. A hundred men went on for him, right? It's on, it's all, on the news and all this at the time. He was there. I said, John, you play him. He's my pal, John. So was uh, uh, Joycey. Curtis is not there now. He's somewhere else. There's other people in the jail. You know, my wing has been a lot of trouble. Hostage takings with screws and all that, right? It's a mad gaff. I'm the only person, B-Cat, that kept there for eight years. No one had done eight years. The most of B-Cat had been there for four years. So they dig me out because of the McVicker son and the escapes. But when I go there, I won't, I won't go down the workshop. So we're back to the dust. I took six nickings. I get a week's block. I get lose the TV, canteen, all that. And in the end, they say, go education. So they swallowed. I was the only person, one other, who followed the dust thing. So I was the only person who, who down the workshop, wouldn't go. It's because I don't care about a block. It don't bother me. So I had the first year there, or six months, I had a lot of trouble, right? And the people I have it with are high profile in the jail. So they don't like that either. You can't win with them. But they left me alone, but they left me there for eight fucking years, these people. So I should have got about a 13 totality of sentence, and it was a geezer called Kwame. He said to me, how long should you, oh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. What happens is, I go down to the doctors, and I'd had a trapped nerve, and it took about a year for it to go, and I lost all small muscles in my knee, and I've got a knee injury, from, for, for, and it altered my ability to run. I can't run without hurting my knee because of trapped nerve. They wouldn't do a, an MRI scan. So I'd murders with this um, doctor. So when I go down the healthcare, I've got Billingsley. He rings up straight away and says, hospital appointment. I said, but you don't give hospital appointments like that. You don't fucking thing. I said, but he went, no. He said, I said, why? He said, it could be cancer. So I go down the thing, they do a test. He said, if it's something wrong, we'll let you know. I'm not doing nothing. Then I had to go down New Year's Eve. They did something else, a proper scan. Then I go into January. So I've, I've caught cancer. And I never told no one. Like in the, in the prison, I told. And I told my mate John. And he told people in Liverpool, which I didn't really want to do, but he did. But I never told anyone. None of my mates know. Why? Because I ain't really a sort of geezer. I mean, I just don't. It's Why not, am I saying prefer? No, what I thought was, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to live, I'm going to live. I didn't. What I was trying to say when I got out, you know, I didn't tell anyone. I've never told anyone. And my mum and all that. I didn't worry my mum. I just don't. I'm, I'm funny in certain things. I just couldn't be bothered going into it all. Anyway, I've got it. And on about the third visit to the hospital, they've got me cuffed, but when you go in at the scan, you're on your own. You, you, there's no you, screws have to stand out because it's radioactive. So I said, Gov, we're going in there in a minute. Take the thing off. He went, nah. I said, can I use the toilet, please? So I come out, single cuff, long cuff. 
he said, Doug, he said, I said, no, you're not putting me on the cuffs. So they jumped me, right? Not only did they jump me, right? Put me on the floor and all that, right? I'm not going to fight because I'm going home. I said, you fuck my slags all this. All of a sudden, they said, you're going to miss your uh, things today. You, 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 it's on my tongue somewhere, right? The base of the tongue on my neck somewhere, I don't know. He said, you're going to miss your cancer treatment. And this was true, but this would be a mistake on my part. You shouldn't take these people on. As Frankie Fraser or, or, and Gentry said, always be polite to them. Don't, it's Fraser, don't give, this was said, don't give these people a chance, Russell, ever. Fraser started off with 10 done 20. Roy Shaw said to me, he was on a, on a, he visited him at some Mickey Mouse fucking jail. And they went Fraser, they just, you would think you'd be a cake, would all be frightening him, they weren't. He ended up on hunger strike. And Roy Shaw said, take them, say, take them to eat. And Frankie Fraser went, nah, I'm not eating, I'm on fucking hunger strike. I'll die before I fucking think. But they nearly killed him anyway. So they bust me up and they're not going to give me my treatment. So when I go the next day, they say you can have the two treatments. So that was reasonable. But what happened was it fucked my throat up. I couldn't eat. This is the danger. They put a tube in there and the feed I was allergic to. So over the six weeks of treatment, that, that's the chemo once a week. But the other thing there is it was really robust, they said. I had a seven in 10 chance of living three out of 10 of dying. I couldn't eat. I was allergic to the feed. I went from 14 stone fit to 10. So when people see me sometimes in the morning, they're in a state of shock because they might not have seen me for a while. And I could see people's boat. And the woman come there and said, you've got, to, you've got to fight. I said, I'm fighting. I said, I haven't got a fucking energy, Susie. I said, I haven't got any energy. I said, but I know how to contain my energy. I'm not losing energy. I'm all right. I'll be all right. Anyway, around about June, I've got two months left to go. I'm now 12 stone. I, uh, people come down to visit me, Terry Smith, uh, Oh, Dave Armani, done 45 years. 45 years, killed someone in jail. He's going home on about 50 years, right? He used to bring me down for Joyce, he's doing a 42 stretch. For supposedly gang and killings and all that, right? So anyway, I've got all these people coming down. Joyce said, I thought he was going to die. He said, they said nine people have been in that cell and they've all died. They call it the death cell. I said, why don't you have a fucking bet? He said, the screw said you was going to die. He said, no, you, Russell, you fucking die on purpose. So it cost me a grand, right? <laughs> so he was great stuff. He was a really good friend. And I got out of jail on about 12 stone. And Rachel, who was one of the screws that jumped me, right? She come down and carried the stuff. She didn't say sorry for what happened. I was pleased she did. I'd known her eight years, right? But the other two geezers, uh, anyway, carried my stuff. I was very weak. And uh, as I walked out the gate, it was a security screw. He didn't say good luck or anything. Come, you know what I mean? <laughs> Done late stretch. They didn't even say good luck, right? But I didn't even look at him. It opened up. And as I walk out, there's a woman screw coming down who knew me. She knew I was going home. But I didn't say nothing to her because I'd never spoke to him in my life. You know what I mean? I, I know one screw there, Mr. Uh, Binningsley, right? Dog screw, but there were screws there who hated me and they would come down while I was in the hospital and say, you're right, Ron. They showed a bit of sympathy, some of them. And when I get, when I get released, there's this dog screw. When I come on the wing, he said, if you don't go down the workshop, I'm taking you in arms. I said, take it, do what you want. He said, because we're not having you lay down the law here. I said, I don't care, do what you want, right? And he got moved wings. So another screw, when I lost me in arms, another screw gave it back to me, the head thing, because I was prepared to go education. So this dog screw, who was a right dog, when I had the cancer, he, he was come down once every two weeks. So Grant, I hope you do well. So it was a cunt, but when I was dying, I'd give him his Jewish thing. So as I go out, he, he discharges me. You know what I mean? And if it had been another screw, I might have fucking shook up, but I couldn't shake his hand, you know what I mean? Because he was just a bum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a cunt, but he, showed, he, but he, he come down. Others come down, four or five, and, um, and all my mates every day, right? So anyway, I was shattered. It was, it was really difficult. So now I'm walking out the gate, right? So this is the last bit. See, 30 screws coming. I didn't recognise one screw. 
all of a sudden, it was one nil <laughs> six years earlier. And I went to him, wait, governor. He's not expecting, it's a disper it's a maximum security prison. You're not expecting anyone to come out. I'll never forget, he went, he couldn't believe it. He went, I said, I'm going home. And I did. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> How's life been since you've been out? It's all right. And I'm not as fit as I was and I'm not as sharp and, you know, a bit bored, but I don't do anything and I, I don't have it with criminals. How long have you been out now, Russell? Five trips in a couple of months' time. What about the relationship with your dad and that? When you he came died. Out? What yeah, happened was... sorry to hear that. Yeah, what it was, I, I, the last letter I wrote to him, I said to him, listen, I wish you well. We will not meet again. He had words, I had words, and and I bumped into Laurie Professor Taylor, who helped him in prison. And uh, he said, I said, just tell him I've gone straight. I mean, I didn't have a job or nothing. I ain't got a job now, but I said, I've gone straight. I don't do anything. Just let him know that. He said, I'll tell him to get in touch with you. I said, no. I said, we had our chance all through my life to get on. But all through my life, Laurie, we, we, are, we, in my twenties, I got on like a house on fire, but he would always say, "Like you just fucking, you don't know when to stop. You just fucking want to take everything on. You, you you're gonna slaughter your mum. She's gonna not be out to cope with this. This is before the, the robberies." But I said to him, "I can't live my life through my mum or you, Dad." I said, "You're like a dummy, nothing to me." I said, "You know who are you to tell me I should learn through you?" That was the problem. And once I said I won't speak to him again. I, I didn't, and he died skin in a fucking caravan. And had I known that, I thought he was doing well. I, I would have gone and seen him. That's different, because he was struggling. And he's my dad and I love him, I would have gone and seen him. But I thought he had a, you know, a chunk of dough in this out and other. I'm not one of them people, if we fall out, that, that's kind of it, you know? And yeah. we, I said, we've had 25 years, Sir Laura, so we've had 25 years to be pals, and we ain't. So I'm not gonna start being his pal now. Now, you know, I'm an old bastard and he's double old. I just, but tell him I wish him well. How hard is that, Russell, when you see somebody involved in a life of crime, robberies on the run, making films, very high profile, famous, and then seeing them die alone? Like, does that worry you that that could be no, you? I, no, 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 it doesn't bother me because I believe in heaven. I believe in an afterlife. So it doesn't bother me, death. I've never been frightened of death. Why it, do you think that is? Because when I was six, I thought there was an afterlife. That's the bottom line. I remember thinking there's a God and there's an afterlife. So I don't care about death. I don't care about death. That doesn't mean to say you can't frighten me, but you, uh, you couldn't frighten me with death. So I was disappointed when I were never run the first time. It done me because I thought, well, you must have bottled it. But it wasn't. It's to do with your central nervous system. You've got to keep that sharp by keeping balance early nights. When I was on the run for the Picasso, I was a machine. No girlfriend, N no contact with anyone. But I, I altered it the last year. When I when I come back, I altered it for the last year, and it made a difference. But, but two years away, it never come close to me. Apart from when I made the mistake in Leeds. What I've noticed through your story as well with the escapes in prisons, there's always when this came on top, you've always been drunk. Exactly right. I haven't got alcohol. I haven't got alcohol problem. It's, it's like. Your bearings are all over the place. You're not as sharp as you should be, especially on a throw. Put, put it this way: you wouldn't do a. You wouldn't. This is what I say if you're on the run. You wouldn't do a marathon or go in a boxing ring drunk. So if you're on the run, don't get drunk even one night, because that night is when the police might arrive. Yeah, the coppers only need to get lucky once. Like you says, Ella, you've been lucky a few times. But I've been lucky many times. As soon as they're lucky, you're done. You're doing a 15 stretch or a 16 stretch. What about your mum, Russell? My mum, she she worried over the COVID and all that. So I see my mum, you know, quite a lot. She's still alive and well. Yeah, she's very fit, mum. My mum, my, my, her, my, her dad lived to 100, her, her grandmother lived to 99, and I knew the grandmother as a little boy. Mm -hmm. So my grandma, my nan, big woman, she she lived to fit. My dad's nan lived to about 80. So I'm bigger. I thought my dad might live to late 80s. He was still running, shadow boxing, mm -hmm. lived in a caravan. If I'd known he was skinned and on his own and cold, I would have gone and seen him. Has there ever been temptation that you've been out walking past a bank or seeing something you think, mm. I'll tell you what it is, right? I, you, you know you can go and get one score, but that's what got me in trouble the, the second time. Is it like an addiction? No, it's, it's not an addiction, but you know it's easy. It's like anyone who does anything, shoplifting or anything, but 
I got in trouble because I give it one more go and I lost blood. Lost a big scar there I had. And had I, when I then get, I could have got the IPP. If I don't bump into the geezer, this gas geezer, and he tells me about the three judges, I'm probably sit, I'm probably just finishing off now. I wouldn't have been out the last five years because they would have said, you've got to do seven. But because I won't go workshops, because I argue my case, and I've smashed screws and all that, kick, apart from that one screw I kick, kicked, I've hit a screw. Well, who's the maddest bastard you've been in prison with? It'd be, well, three, the three people are Roy Shaw, because he said to me, the nurses come for him, the male nurse. He said, Roy, who's in Broadmoor, please, you turn it in tonight and we're going to kill you. Or they're going to kill you. And he said, I knew that was it. You reach your limit with, with Finn Bronson, never reached the limit. I've heard him from the block, <clears throat> so you could say it's him, but. John Iannacci, who I used to play chess with, and it's on, on the, it was on that program about Full Sutton. He's my pal. And I always knew he'd, um, he was, he's probably the most, everyone was very careful of this guy. He's 20 stone, he's a boxer, but he's handy in all sorts of ways. And um, <clears throat> he beat me 17, 16 in a game of chess over, over years. He, when I'm in the hospital, Two days before I go home, Screw's come and said, John's gone into one. I see a screw out the window. I thought, what's he doing there? That's not a place they stand, but the whole prison had been cordoned off. John had smashed, cut the screw, battered them, three screws, burnt the kitchen down, smashed other things up, and they waited till there was 100 men. That's what a con told me, that's what I see on TV. They waited till 100 men, and when he come on, he lost his training shirt, he put it back on. Got one punching on the shield, and they'd done it. And they more or less killed him. But <clears throat> that's only one incident. So maybe Roy Shaw, maybe Bronson. I never met Bronson. I heard him shouting. John O'Nash is very brave. Um, and Billy Gentry, and you don't know nothing about Billy Gentry, right? But Billy Gentry had done like 18 out of 18. And they'd done the first thing about self for him. And Fraser, they're the ones that I've met and are. are my dad, my dad had a rule, but he, he would, you know, he would be a bit, he wouldn't go to them limits. He wouldn't go to those excesses. These people have to shit up, take beatings. You want to be a prison tough guy, you've got to be able to take a strip cell, block for years, and a beating. Those five people can take it, and I admire them people. I was always stopped before that point. You don't want to go down that road. They can kill you or fuck your mind up. Mm. But block, you, I know, swear, you put me in a block for two years, I laugh at you, I don't, I don't get me. I don't care about uh, any, I don't need nothing. I don't need a PlayStation. When I, I was away, when it was slot buckets and all that, nothing. Now you've got TV, yeah, toilet. PlayStation, shower. Shower and a phone. So there's nothing to really create about for me, but someone like poor Charlie, he, it's all the profession of violence. If you're a, if you're a, a robber, you understand how to rob. Maybe some of the guards I've done, they would have beat me in a fight. I don't know, but they didn't fucking know how to stop me in, in, in certain situations. I can't explain it. You know when to pants or whatever. A screw knows his job. A doorman knows his job. An, an ambulance people know their job. It's all, you know, they sometimes have problems with people. So it's all different types of case fighter knows his job. A boxer knows his job. A, a knife man, a gunman, they all got different... They're all, they're all wired a different way. I'm wired to escape and rob. <laughs> That's yeah. it. That's what I know. And from a kid and gamble, I don't gamble now, but I had gambling in my spirit. And I know how to take a chance and a risk. And my only advice to people, if you're young, and don't take, don't let it escalate. Like my dad started off with an eight. He was a no one. When he went 23, he became 26. And if you can get abroad, get abroad, but it's very difficult. But the end line for a wanted man, Jesse James, or it's a bullet in the head or a bullet in the back. It's a, it, all these people, if you push the limits, if Bronson had been a robber, Bronson gets ironed out. But he's not a robber, he's a man of violence in prison. He understands to an extreme. So he's probably the bravest man 
in, in that sense. He, yeah. he's, he's an astonishing man and they'll kill him. What do you think, Russell, looking back in your life? I, I know someone from the Angels. She's a really good friend of mine. She says, I'll, I'll probably tell her about this program, I might not. But she says to me, if you go back 20 years, what would you do? I said, I'd do it all again. I'd do it all again. Because the people I met, I can't tell you, like the people I met, oh, this is the other thing. So Kwame says to me, had you got the 13 or had you got out a year earlier, would you have gone straight to the hospital with that? I said, no. It was only because I got the, tr the bit of wax from being in the cell and it was a fruit. If I, if I get a year less, I'll probably die three, two years later. Do you see what I'm saying? Because I wouldn't have gone to the hospital. I wouldn't have trapped the nerve. So, but getting back to your question, if I, as, as I say to someone, no, I wouldn't change it because I met, I met people like he's called Rob Riley, he was my friend from Doncaster, uh, Bambi, Hampstead, people who was funny, Richard Delaney, people who were funny, Leggy Parnell, he used to do wrestling, he used to choke me to death. These people, I, I, they're your family, because you're living with them every day. That's what prison's about. It's the wing you're on, and I was blessed by being with people who were funny and can rare and will stand up to screws. Uh -huh. And I was around people like that, and... If, I've, if I'm rich, it's the people I met in jail and the people on the trot who helped me. And then people, obviously my mum has gone through hell for me, but what I'm trying to say, you know your family. My, my, my people I met in jail and on the run, I give them 10 out of 10. I, 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 I'm blessed to have met them people and I thank God for that. I really do. And I say that humbly. I, it's a, it was a great honour to meet them people. So I'm not going to put back the clock and say, don't do that, do that. I'll do it all again. But I wouldn't want to see someone else do it all yeah. that because I could have got killed. Where do you go forward for the future? What's your plans? I I know I I haven't really got a plan. Just take it day by day, try and stay out of prison. I say the probation. I said to her, I said, well, I ain't robbed now, where am I? And I don't get tempted by anything. And she ain't stupid. She if you're gonna do something, you're gonna do it. Like she they sometimes say to this, she said, oh, no, no, if he's gonna do something, we ain't gonna stop him. I mean, he ain't gonna stop me. What a liberty it would be if I went back on the pavement. Because one, they'd life me off, and two, it'd have to be, I think the Jack Mezzarine film, I said, out or dead. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do, go get a life 10. They're not going to let me out in 10. I'll do a 20. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm late 50s now. I'm an old codger. But I'm still a bit lively, but I can't run on my legs. So I'm not as lively as I was. And my, my trick, was being able to get away quick. And if it went wrong, run. You know, I've had chases. I don't get nowhere near me because I have a route and I've gone. And it, where's, you know, it's, I don't lose motorbikes and all that game. You know, I don't work with firms, but I did on that one occasion and unlucky for me. I've got, so to go again would be not right and it would be... So I say, though. Well, you may not get caught. <laughs> it's like the marble. It's like the marble. You might hit, you might not. But what I'm trying to say, I might not get caught. So, but what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> if I did, it would be like I've had my last chance. You know, along the way, maybe I could have got killed. But they was professional. They never killed me. But my dad was worried they would. Mm. Oh, by the way, the flying squad weren't allowed. When I got down in Southampton, they never had guns because the cause there said, no, you people are dangerous. It says something like your reputation precedes you. You're not having guns here. And they've done it themselves in Southampton. If it had been the flying squad, I don't think they'd have shot me, but if I did the wrong move, they would have done. Because you get one chance of them. If you go for your gun when it's on you, they shoot you. And I can tell you stories, like terrible stories about people being shot dead. So I know all these stories. I, who, who, uh, Gary Wilson was nicked with the geezer come out. He went like that. They shot him dead. So Easterbrook, he's, he's arguably very brave. He come out as a 56-year-old man with his gun and shot him. And he said they bottled it. The, the bullets were missing, but they shot his finger off. So would I go to them levels? You, you can't say you would, because most people, when they get surrounded, Panic. they go like that. But Dillinger wouldn't. Mezzarine wouldn't. Jesse James wouldn't, not that he got done that way, he got done in the back. All them people, but they all end up getting caught and some of them get killed, but that's the history of crime in, in, in the world. You don't really win in the end, I don't think. Not robbers. They, they're too, they're wild robbers. They've got something wild in them. 
they're different to drug dealers. They've got a different mind. I like robbers. They're my favourites. You know, I, I love the stories about Jesse James, like Misery, Dillinger. But they're killers, you know. If it comes on, they're killed. But at least they, they'll have a shootout with armed police. Yeah. For anybody watching, Russell, who's maybe wanting to get involved in a life of crime or maybe want to start robbing, what advice would you have for them? If you get caught once, don't go again. I, I wouldn't say, I, I'm not one of the people who says to people, don't do so. I'm not into that reform thing. If it's in your spirit to rob or shoplift, burgle, fight, whatever it is, but you, you, and you can't, if you're on the run, you cannot think of family. You have to think of yourself. You don't, don't go to jail and say, I've got to be good for my family. You should be good for yourself. You get a, one life, make the most of it. And I've met people in jail, the people I respect, they turn their life around. But on a free stretch, it's hard. You go in, you come out, you go in, you come out. On a 15, I would say, if you get a 15 or a 10, you've got, if you're away for five or six years, you can turn your life around. You can learn things. But like I learned quite a lot. When I, I've got a degree, can't get a job with it. But what I'm saying is, you, you get a chance to turn your life around on a long stretch, but don't go again. You don't do what I've done, is what I would say. If you want to rob, go, good luck to you, I wish you well. But don't go the second time, because you could ruin, Gentry done three big arm robbery things. He'd done an 18, a 10, and a six, all behind the door. I would be another one of him if I went again. So I can't go again, because I've been given a chance, so I won't rob ever again. That's it. Finished. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, so listen for coming on today. It's been an absolute it's been mad a story. It's a roller coaster, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I genuinely wish you all the best for the future. I know we're in talks with things in the pipeline in the future, so hopefully we can get things sorted for you. We'll not touch on them now, but listen, that's just your life of fucking prisons. No doubt there's so much more that information I've got, you I've can I've got give. twice as well, but drive yeah, you mad. Yeah. I don't want to bore you to death. I'm sorry it took up so much of your oh, time. Listen, man, you know I've, what I mean? I've enjoyed it. I know the listeners will love this. So, listen, thanks for coming on today and telling us. It's a great honour. I wish you all the best and uh, take care, brother. Thank yes. you very much.